Chapter 122, Midnight Aloft, Thunder and Lightning The main topsail yard, Peshtigo passing new lashings around it. Um, 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 stop that thunder! Plenty too much thunder up here. What's the use of thunder? Um, 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 we don't want thunder, we want rum. Give us a glass of rum. Um, um, um. Passage 123. During the most violent shocks of the typhoon, the man at the Pequod's jawbone tiller had several times been reelingly hurled to the deck by its spasmodic motions, even though preventer tackles had been attached to it, for they were slack, because some play to the tiller was indispensable. In a severe gale like this, while the ship is but a tossed shuttlecock to the blast, it is by no means uncommon to see the needles in the compasses, at intervals, go round and round. It was thus with the Pequods. At almost every shock the helmsman had not failed to notice the whirling velocity with which they revolved upon the cards. It is a sight that hardly anyone can behold without some sort of unwanted emotion. Some hours after midnight, the typhoon abated so much that through the strenuous exertions of Starbuck and Stubb, one engaged forward and the other aft, the shivered remnants of the jib and fore and main top sails were cut adrift from the spars and went eddying away to leeward, like the feathers of an albatross, which sometimes are cast to the winds when that storm-tossed bird is on the wing. The three corresponding new sails were now bent and reefed, and a storm trysail was set further aft, so that the ship soon went through the water with some precision again, and the course, for the present, east-south-east, which he was to steer, if practicable, was once more given to the helmsman. For during the violence of the gale, he had only steered according to its vicis vicissitudes, but as he was now bringing the ship as near her course as possible, watching the compass meanwhile, lo, a good sign, the wind seemed coming round astern, aye, the foul breeze becomes fair. Instantly the yards are squared to the lively song of Ho, the fair wind, O ho he yo, cheerly, men, the crew singing for joy, that so promising an event should so soon have falsified the evil portents preceding it. In compliance with the standing order of his commander, to report immediately, and at any one of the twenty-four hours, any decided change in the affairs of the deck, Starbuck had no sooner trimmed the yards to the breeze, however reluctantly and gloomily, then he mechanically went below to apprise Captain Ahab of the circumstance. Ear knocking at his stateroom, he involuntarily paused before it a moment. The cabin lamp, taking long swings this way and that, was burning fitfully and casting fitful shadows upon the old man's bolted door, a thin one with fixed blinds inserted in place of the upper panels. The isolated subterraneousness of the cabin made a certain humming silence to reign there, though it was hooped round by all the roar of the elements. The loaded muskets in the rack were shiningly revealed as they stood upright against the forward bulkhead. Starbuck was an honest, upright man, but out of Starbuck's heart, at that instant, when he saw the muskets, there strangely evolved an evil thought, but so blent with its neutral or good accompaniments that for the instant he hardly knew it for itself. He would have shot me once, he murmured. Yes, there's the very musket that he pointed at me. That one with the studded stock. Let me touch it, lift it. Strange that I, who have handled so many deadly lances, strange that I should shake so now. Loaded, I must see. Aye, aye, and powder in the pan. That's not good. Best spill it. Wait, I'll cure myself of this. I'll hold the musket boldly while I think. I come to report a fair wind to him. But how fair? Fair for death and doom. That's fair for Moby Dick. It's a fair wind that only fair for that accursed fish. The very tube he pointed at me. The very one. This one. I hold it here. He would have killed me with the very thing I handle now. Aye, and he would have fain kill all his men. Does he not say he will not strike his spurs, spars to any gale? Has he not dashed his heavenly quadrant? 
and in these some perilous seas, groped he not his way by mere dead reckoning of the error abounding log? And in this very typhoon did he not swear that he would have no lightning rods? But shall this crazed old man be tamely suffered to drag a whole ship's company down to doom, doom with him? Yes, it would make him the willful murderer of thirty men and more, if this ship came to any deadly harm. And come to deadly harm, my soul swears this ship will, if Ahab have his way. If, then, he were this instant put aside, that crime would not be his. Ha! Is he muttering in his sleep? Yes, just there, in there, he's sleeping. Sleeping? Aye, but still alive, and soon awake again. I can't withstand thee, then, old man. Not reasoning, not remonstrance, not entreaty wilt thou hearken to. All this thou scornst. Flat obedience to thy own flat commands, this is all thou breathest. Aye, and sayst the man have vowed thy vow, sayst all of us are Ahab's. Great God forbid, but is there no other way, no lawful way? Making Make him a prisoner to be taken home. What? Hope to wrest this old man's living power from his own living hands? Only a fool would try it. Say he were pinioned even, knotted all over with ropes and hoers, chained down to ring bolts on this cabin floor. He would be more hideous than a caged tiger then. I could not endure the sight, could not possibly fly his howlings. All comfort, sleep itself, inestimable reason would leave me on the long intolerable voyage. What, then? remains. The land is hundreds of leagues away, and locked Japan the nearest. I stand alone here upon an open sea, with two oceans and a whole continent between me and law. Aye, aye, tis so. Is heaven a murderer when its lightning strikes I would be murderer in his bed, tindering sheets and skin together? And would I be a murderer then if, and slowly, stealthily, and half sideways looking, he placed the loaded musket's end against the door. On this level, Ahab's hammock swings within. His head this way, a touch, and Starbuck may survive to hug his wife and child again. Oh, Mary, Mary, boy, boy, boy. But I've awake thee not to death, old man. Who can tell to what unsounded deeps Starbuck's body this day weak may sink with all the crew? Great God, where art thou? Shall I? Shall I? The wind has gone down and shifted, sir. The fore and main topsails are reefed and set. She heeds her course. Stern all, O oh, Moby Dick, I clutch thy heart at last. Such were the sounds that now came hurtling from out the old man's tormented sleep, as if Starbuck's voice had caused the long dumb dream to speak. The yet levelled musket shook like a drunkard's arm against the panel. Starbuck seemed wrestling with an angel, but turning from the door, he placed the death tube in its rack and left the place. He's too sound asleep, Mr. Stubb. Go thou down and wake him and tell him, I must see to the deck here. Thou knowst what to say. Chapter 124. The Needle. Next morning, the not yet subsided sea rolled in long, slow billows of mighty bulk and striving in the Pequod's gurgling track, pushed her on like giant's palms outspread. The strong, unstaggering breeze abounded so that sky and air seemed vast outbellying sails. The whole world boomed before the wind. Muffled in the full morning light, the invisible sun was only known by the spread intensity of his place, where his bayonet rays moved on in stacks. Emblazonings, as of crowned Babylonian kings and queens, reigned over everything. The sea was as a crucible of molten gold that bubblingly leaps with light and heat. Long maintaining an enchanted silence, Ahab stood apart, and every time the tattering ship loweringly pitched down her bowsprit, he turned to eye the bright sun's rays produced ahead. And when she profoundly settled by the stern, he turned behind and saw the sun's rearward place, and how the same yellow rays were blending with his undeviating wake. Ha ha, my ship, thou mightest well be taken now for the sea chariot of the sun. Ho ho, all ye nations before my prow, I bring the sun to ye. Yoke on the further billows, hallo, a tandem, I drive the sea. 
but suddenly reined back by some counter thought, he hurried towards the helm, huskily demanding how the ship was heading. East, southeast, sir, said the frightened steersman. Thou liest, smiting him with his clenched fist. Heading east at this hour in the morning and the sun astern? Upon this, every soul was confounded, for the phenomenon just then observed by Ahab had unaccountably escaped everyone else, but its very blinding palpableness must have been the cause. Thrusting his head halfway into the binnacle, Ahab caught one glimpse of the compasses. His uplifted arm slowly fell. For a moment, he almost seemed to stagger. Standing behind him, Starbuck looked, and lo, the two compasses pointed east, and the Pequod was as infallibly going west. But ere the first wild alarm could get out abroad among the crew, the old man with a rigid laugh exclaimed, I have it. It has happened before. Mr. Starbuck, last night's thunder turned our compasses. That's all. Thou hast before now heard of such a thing, I take it? I, but never before has it happened to me, sir said the pale mate gloomily. Here it must needs be said that accidents like this have in more than one case occurred to ships in violent storms. The magnetic energy as developed in the mariner's needle is, as all know, essentially one with the electricity beheld in heaven. Hence, it is not to be much marveled at that such things should be. In instances where the lightning has actually struck the vessel so as to smite down some of the spars and rigging, the effect upon the needle has at times been still more fatal, all its lodestone virtue being annihilated so that the before magnetic steel was of no more use than an old wife's knitting needle. But in either case, the needle never again of itself recovers the original virtue thus marred or lost. And if the binnacle compasses be affected, the same fate reaches all the others that may be in the ship, even were the lowermost one inserted into the kelson. Deliberately standing before the binnacle and eyeing the transpointed compasses, the old man with the sharp of his extended hand now took the precise bearing of the sun and satisfied that the needles were exactly inverted, shouted out his orders for the ship's course to be changed accordingly. The yards were hard up and once more the Pequod thrust her undaunted bows into the opposing wind for the supposed fair one had only been juggling her. Meanwhile, whatever were his own secret thoughts, Starbuck said nothing, but quietly he issued all requisite orders, while Stubb and Flask, who in some small degree seemed then to be sharing his feelings, likewise unmurmuringly acquiesced. As for the men, though some of them lowly rumbled, their fear of Ahab was greater than their fear of fate. But as ever before, the pagan harpooners remained almost wholly unimpressed, or if impressed, it was only with a certain magnetism shot into their congenial hearts from inflexible Ahabs. For a space, the old man walked the deck in rolling reveries, but chancing to slip with his ivory heel, he saw the crushed copper sight tubes of the quadrant he had the day before dashed to the deck. Thou poor, proud heaven gazer and sun's pilot, yesterday I wrecked thee, and today the compasses would fain have wrecked me. So... So, but Ahab is lord over the level lodestone yet. Mr. Starbuck, a lance without the pole, a top maul, and the smallest of the sailmaker's needles, quick. Accessory, perhaps, to the impulse dictating the thing he was now about to do were certain prudential motives whose object might have been to revive the spirits of his crew by a stroke of his subtle skill in a manner so wondrous as that of the inverted compasses. Besides, the old man well knew that to steer by transpointed needles, though clumsily practicable, was not a thing to be passed over by superstitious sailors without some shudderings and evil portents. Men, said he, steadily turning upon the crew as the mate handed him the things he had demanded. My men, the thunder turned old Ahab's needles, but out of this bit of steel Ahab can make one of his own that will point as true as any. Abashed glances of servile wonder were exchanged by the sailors as this was said, and with fascinated eyes they awaited whatever magic might follow. But Starbuck looked away. With a blow from the top maul, Ahab knocked off the steel head of the lance, and then handing to the mate the long iron rod remaining, bade him hold it upright without its touching the deck. Then with the maul, after repeatedly smiting the upper end of this iron rod, 
He placed the blunted needle endwise on the top of it, and less strongly hammered that, several times, the mate still holding the rod as before. Then going through some small strange motions with it, whether indispensable to the magnetizing of the steel or merely intended to augment the awe of the crew is uncertain. He called for linen thread and moving to the binnacle, slipped out the two reversed needles there and horizontally suspended the sail needle by its middle over one of the compass cards. At first, the steel went round and round, quivering and vibrating at either end. But at last, it settled to its place when Ahab, who had been intently watching for this result, stepped frankly back from the binnacle and pointing his stretched arm towards it, exclaimed, Look ye for yourselves, if Ahab be not lord of the level lodestone. The sun is east and that compass swears it. One after another, they peered in for nothing but their own eyes could persuade such ignorance as theirs. And one after another, they slunk away. In his fiery eyes of scorn and triumph, you then saw Ahab in all his fatal pride. Passage 125, The Log and Line. While now the fated Pequod had been so long afloat this voyage, the log and line had but very seldom been in use. Owing to a confident reliance upon other means of determining the vessel's place, some merchantmen and many whalemen, especially when cruising, wholly neglect to heave the log, though at the same time and frequently more for form's sake than anything else, regularly putting down upon the customary slate the course steered by the ship, as well as the presumed average rate of progression every hour. It had been thus with the Pequod. The wooden reel and angular log attached hung, long untouched, just beneath the railing of the aft bulwark. Rains and spray had dampened it. The sun and wind had warped it. All the elements had combined to rot a thing that hung so idly. But heedless of all this, his mood seized Ahab as he happened to glance upon the reel, not many hours after the magnet scene, and he remembered how his quadrant was no more, and recalled his frantic oath about the level log and line. The ship was sailing plungingly, astern the billows rolled in riots. Forward here, heave the log. Two seamen came, the golden-hued Tahitian and the grizzly manxman. Take the real one of ye, I'll heave. They went towards the extreme stern on the ship's lee side, where the deck, with the oblique energy of the wind, was now almost dipping into the creamy, sidelong rushing sea. The Manxman took the reel and holding it high up by the projecting handle ends of the spindle round which the spool of line revolved, so stood with the angular log hanging downwards till Ahab advanced to him. Ahab stood before him and was lightly unwinding some thirty or forty turns to form a preliminary hand roll to toss overboard when the old Manxman, who was intently eyeing both him and the line, made bold to speak. Sir, I mistrust it. This line looks far gone. Long heat and wet have spoiled it. Twill hold, old gentleman. Long heat and wet have they spoiled thee. Thou seemst to hold. Or truer, perhaps, life holds thee, not thou it. I hold the spool, sir. But just as my captain says, with these gray hairs of mine, tis not worth while disputing, especially with a superior whom ne'er confess. What's that? There's now a patched professor in Queen Nature's granite-founded college. But methinks he's too subservient. Where wert thou born? In the little uh, rocky isle of man, sir. Excellent. Thou hadst hit the world by that. I know not, sir, but I was born there. In the isle of man, eh? Well, the other way, it's good. Here's a man for man. A man born in once independent man and now unmanned of man which is sucked in by what? Up the reel, the dead blind wall butts all inquiring heads at last. Up with it, so. The log was heaved. The loose coils rapidly straightened out in a long dragging line astern. And then instantly the reel began to whirl. In turn, jerkingly raised and lowered by the rolling billows, the towering, the towing resistance of the log caused the old reelman to stagger strangely. Hold hard, snap. The overstrained line sagged down in one long festoon. The tugging log was gone. I crush the quadrant, the thunder turns the needles, and now the mad sea parts the log line. But Ahab can mend all, haul in here, Tahitian, reel up, Manxman, 
And look ye, let the carpenter make another log, and mend thou the line, see to it. There he goes now. To him nothing's happened, but to me the skewers seem loosening out of the middle of the world. All in, all in, Tahitian. These lines run whole and whirling out, come in broken and dragging slow. Ha, ah, Pip! Come to help, eh, Pip? Pip? Whom call ye Pip? Pip jump for the whaleboat. Pip's missing. Well, let's see now if you haven't fished him up here, fisherman. It drags hard, I guess he's holding on. Jerk him, Tahiti. Jerk him off. We haul in no cowards here. Oh, there's his arm just breaking the water. A hatchet. A hatchet. Cut it off. We haul in no cowards here. Captain Ahab, sir, here's Pip trying to get on board again. Peace, thou crazy loon, cried the Manxman, seizing him by the arm. Away from the quarter deck. Tis the greater idiot ever scolds the lesser, muttered Ahab, advancing. Hands off from that holiness. Where sayest thou Pip was, boy? A stern there, sir, a stern, lo. And who art thou, boy? I see not my reflection of the vacant pupil of thy eyes. Oh, God, that man should be a thing for immortal souls to sieve through. Who art thou, boy? Bell boy, sir, ship's crier, ding, dong, ding, pip, pip, pip. One hundred pounds of clay reward for pip. Five feet high, looks cowardly, quickest known by that. Ding, dong, dick. Who's seen Pip the coward? There can be no hearts above the snow line. Oh, ye frozen heavens, look down here. Ye did beget this luckless child and have abandoned him, ye creative libertines. Here, boy, Ahab's cabin shall be Pip's home henceforth while Ahab lives. Thou touchest my innermost center, boy. Thou art tied to me by cords woven of my heart strings. Come, let's down. What's this? Here's velvet shark skin, intently gazing at Ahab's hand and feeling it. Ah, now, had poor Pip but felt so kind a thing as this, perhaps he had ne'er been lost. This seems to me, sir, as a man rope, something that weak souls may hold by. Oh, sir, let old Perth now come and rivet these two hands together, the black one and the white, for I will not let this go. Oh, boy. Nor will I thee, unless I should thereby drag thee to worse horrors than there are here. Come then to my cabin. Lo, ye believers in God's all goodness and in man all ill. Lo, ye, see the omniscient gods oblivious of suffering man. And man, though idiotic and knowing not what he does, yet full of the sweet things of love and gratitude. Come, I feel prouder leading thee by thy black hand than though I grasp an emperor's. There go two daft ones now, muttered the old Manxman, one daft with strength, the other daft with weakness. But here's the end of the rotten line, all dripping too. Mend it, eh? I think we'd best have a new line altogether. I'll see Mr. Stubb about it. Chapter 126, The Life Movie. Steering now southeastward by Ahab's leveled steel, and her progress solely determined by Ahab's level log in line, the Pequod held on her path towards the equator. Making so long a passage through such unfrequented waters, decrying no ships, and ere long sideways impelled by unvarying trade winds over waves monotonously mild, all these seem the strange calm things preluding some riotous and desperate scene. At last, when the ship drew near to the outskirts, as it were, of the equatorial fishing ground, and in deep, the deep darkness that goes before the dawn was sailing by a cluster of rocky islets, the watch then headed by Flask, was startled by a cry so plaintively wild and unearthly like half-articulated wailings of the ghosts of all Herod's murdered innocents, that one and all they started from their reveries, and for the space of some moments stood, or sat, or leaned, all transfixedly listening, like the carved Roman slave, while that wild cry remained within hearing. The Christian or civilized part of the crew said it was mermaids, and shuddered. But the pagan harpeneers remained unappalled. 
Yet the gray Manxman, the oldest mariner of all, declared that the wild, thrilling sounds that were heard were the voices of newly drowned men in the sea. Below in his hammock, Ahab did not hear of this till gray dawn, when he came to the deck. It was then recounted to him by Flask, not unaccompanied with hinted dark meanings. <laughs> he, he hollowly laughed, and thus explained the wonder. Those rocky islands the ship had passed were the resort of a great number of seals, and some young seals that had lost their dams, or some dams that had lost their cubs, must have risen nigh the ship and kept company with her, crying and sobbing with their human sort of wail. But this only the more affected some of them, because most mariners cherish a very superstitious feeling about seals, arising not only from their peculiar tones when in distress, but also from the human look of their round heads and semi-intelligent faces, seen peeringly uprising from the water alongside. In the sea, under certain circumstances, seals have more than once been mistaken for men. But the bodings of the crew were destined to receive a more most plausible confirmation in the fate of one of their number that morning. At sunrise, this man went from his hammock to his masthead at the fore, and whether it was that he was not yet half waked from his sleep, for sailors sometimes go aloft in a transition state, whether it was thus with the man, there is now no telling. But be that it is, as it may, he had not been long at his perch when a cry was heard, a cry and a rushing. And looking up, they saw a falling phantom in the air, and looking down, a little tossed heap of white bubbles in the blue of the sea. The life buoy, a long slender cask, was dropped from the stern, where it always hung obedient to a cunning spring, but no hand rose to seize it. And the sun, having long beat upon this cask, it had shrunken, so that it slowly filled. And the parched wood also filled at its every pore, and the stuttered, iron-bound cask followed the sailor to the bottom, as if to yield him a pillow, though in sooth but a hard one. And thus the first man of the Pequod that mounted the mast to look out for the white whale, on the white whale's own peculiar ground, that man was swallowed up in the deep. But few, perhaps, thought of that at the time. Indeed, in some sort, they were not grieved at this event, at least as a portent, for they regarded it not as a foreshadowing of evil in the future, but as the fulfillment of an evil already presage. They declared that now they knew the reason for those wild shrieks they had heard the night before. But again, the old Manxman said nay. The lost life buoy was now to be replaced. Starbuck was directed to see to it, but as no cask of sufficient lightness could be found, and as in the feverish ignorance, uh, eagerness of what seemed to the approaching crisis of the voyage, all hands were impatient of any toil but what was directly connected with its final end, whatever that might prove to be. Therefore, they were going to leave the ship's stern unprovided with a buoy, when by certain strange signs and innuendos, Queequeg hinted a hint concerning his coffin. A life buoy of a coffin? cried Starbuck, starting. Rather queer, that, I should say, said Stubb. It'll make a good enough one, said Flask. The carpenter here can arrange it easily. Bring it up. There's nothing else for it, said Starbuck after a melancholy pause. Rig it, carpenter. Do not look at me so. The coffin, I mean. Dost thou hear me? Rig it. And shall I nail down the lid, sir? Moving his hand as with a hammer? Aye. And shall I caulk the seam, sir? Moving his hand as with a caulking iron. Aye. 
And shall I then pay over the same with pitch, sir? Moving his hand as with a pitch pot. Away, what possesses thee to this? Make a life buoy of the coffin and no more. Mr. Stubb, Mr. Flask, come forward with me. He goes off in a huff. The whole he can endure at the parts he balks. Now, I don't like this. I make a leg for Captain Ahab, and he wears it like a gentleman. But I make a bandbox for Queequeg, and he won't put his head into it. Ah, are all my pains going for nothing with that coffin? And now I'm ordered to make a life buoy of it. It's like turning an old coat, going to bring the flesh side on the other side now. I don't like this cobbling sort of business. I don't like it at all. It's undignified. It's not my place. Let tinkers brats do the do tinkerings. We are their betters. I like to take in hand none but clean, virgin, fair and square mathematical jobs. Something that regularly begins at the beginning and is at the middle when midway and comes to an end at the conclusion. Not a cobbler's job. That's at an end in the middle and at the beginning at the end. It's the old woman's tricks to be giving cobbling jobs. <laughs> Lord, what an affection old women have for tinkers. I know an old woman of 65 who ran away with a bald-headed tinker once, and that's the reason I would never work for lonely, old wid uh, lonely widow old women ashore when I kept my job shop in the vineyard. They might have taken it into their lonely old heads to run off with me. But hey ho, there are no caps at sea but snow caps. Let me see, uh, nail down the lid, cock the seams, pay over the same with pitch, batten them down tight, and hang it with the snap spring over the ship's stern. Ah, yeah, wherever such things done before with a coffin. Some superstitious old carpenters now would be tied up in the rigging ere they would do that job. But I'm made of naughty arstook hemlock. I don't budge. Cruppered with a coffin, sailing about with a graveyard tray. But never mind. We workers in woods make bridal bedsteads and card tables, as well as coffins and hearses. We work by the month, or by the job, or by the profit. Not for us to ask the why and wherefore of our work unless it be too confounded cobbling. Then we stash it if we can. <coughs> I'll do the job now, tenderly. I'll have me, let's see, how many in the ship's company all told? Ah, but I've forgotten. Anyway, I'll have me 30 separate Turks-headed lifelines, each three feet long, hanging all around the coffin. Then, if the hull goes down, there'll be 30 lively fellows all fighting for one coffin, a sight not seen very often beneath the sun. Come, hammer, caulk and iron, pitch pot and marlin spike. Let's do it. Chapter 127, The Deck. The coffin laid upon two line lubs between the vice bench and the open hatchway. The carpenter caulking its seams. The string of twisted oakum slowly unwinding from a large roll of it placed in the bosom of his frock. Ahab comes slowly from the cabin gangway and hears Pip following him. Back, lad. I'll be with ye again presently. He goes, Not this hand complies with my humor more genially than that boy. Middle aisle of a church, what's here? Life boy, sir. Mr. Starbuck's orders. Oh, look, sir, beware the hatchway. Well, thank ye, man. Thy coffin lies handy to the vault. Sir, the hatchway? Oh, so it does, sir, so it does. Art thou not the leg maker? Look, did not this stump come from thy shop? I believe it did, sir. Does the feral stand, sir? Well enough. But art thou not also the undertaker? Aye, sir. I patched up this thing here as a coffin for Queequeg but they've sent me now to turning it into something else. Then tell me, art thou not an arrant, all-grasping, intermeddling, monopolizing, heathenish old scamp, 
to be one day making legs and the next day making coffins to clap them in, and yet again life boys out of those coffins. Thou art as unprincipled as the gods, and as much of a jack of all trades. But I do not mean anything, sir. I do as I do. The gods again! Hark ye, dost thou not ever sing working about a coffin? The titans, they say, hum snatches when chirping out the craters for volcanoes, and the gravedigger in the play sings spade in hand. Dost thou never sing, sir? Do I sing? Oh, I'm indifferent enough, sir, for that. But the reason why the gravedigger made music must have been because there was none in his spade. But the caulking mallet is full of it. Hark to it. Aye. And that's because the lid there is a sounding board. And what in all things makes the sounding board is this. There's naught beneath. And yet, a coven with a body in it rings pretty much the same, Carpenter. Hast thou ever helped carry a beer, and heard the coffin knock against the churchyard gates going in? Faith, sir, I've, uh... Faith? What's that? Why, faith, sir, it's only sort of an exclamation, like... That's all, sir. Um, um, go on. I was about to say, sir, that art thou a silkworm? Dost thou spin thy own shroud out of thyself? Well, look at thy bosom. Dispatch, and get these traps out of sight. He goes aft. That was sudden. But squalls come sudden in hot latitudes. I've heard that the Isle of Abermarl... One of the Galapagos is cut by the equator right in the middle. Seems to me some sort of equator cuts yon old man, too, right in his middle. He's always under the line. Fiery hot, I tell ye. He's looking this way. Come, Oakum, quick. Here we go again. This wooden mallet is the cork, and I'm the professor of musical glasses. Tap, tap. Ahab to himself. There's a sight. There's a sound. The gray-headed woodpecker tapping the hollow tree. Blind and dumb might well be envied now. See, that thing rests on two line lubs full of tow lines. A most malicious wag, that fellow. Rat! Tat! So man's seconds tick. Oh, how immaterial are all materials. What things real are there but imponderable thoughts? Here now is the very dreaded symbol of grim death. By a mere hap made the expressive sign of the help and hope of most endangered life. A life boy of a coffin? Does it go further? Can it be, in some spiritual sense, the coffin is, after all, but an immortality preserver? I'll think of that. But no, so far gone am I in the dark side of Earth that its other side, the theoretic bright one, seems but uncertain twilight to me. Will ye never have done, Carpenter, with that accursed sound? I go below. Let me not see that thing here when I return again. Now then, Pip. We'll talk this over. I do suck the most wondrous philosophies from thee. Some unknown conduits from the unknown worlds must empty into thee. Chapter 128. The Pequod meets the Rachel. Next day, a large ship, the Rachel, was descried, bearing directly down upon the Pequod, all her spars thickly clustering with men. At the time, the Pequod was making good speed through the water. But as the broad-winged windward stranger shot nigh to her, the boastful sails all fell together as blank bladders that are burst, and all life fled from the smitten hull. Bad news, she brings bad news, muttered the old Manxman. But ere her commander, who with trumpet to mouth stood up in his boat, ere he could hopefully hail, Ahab's voice was heard. Has seen the white whale? Aye, yesterday. Have you seen a whale boat adrift? Throttling his joy, Ahab negatively answered this unexpected question and would then have fain boarded the stranger when the stranger captain himself, having stopped his vessel's way, 
was seen soon descending her side. A few keen pulls and his boat hook soon clinched the Pequod's main chains and he sprang to the deck. Immediately, he was recognized by Ahab for an Nantucketer he knew, but no formal salutation was exchanged. Where was he? Not killed? Not killed, cried Ahab, closely advancing. How was it? It seemed that somewhat late on the afternoon of the day previous, while three of the strangers' boats were engaged with a shoal of whales, which had led them some four or five miles from the ship, and while they were yet in swift chase to windward, the white hump and head of Moby Dick had suddenly loomed up out of the water, not very far to leeward, whereupon the fourth rigged boat, a reserved one, had been instantly lowered in chase. After a keen sail before the wind, this fourth boat, the swiftest keeled of all, seemed to have succeeded in fastening, at least as well as the man at the masthead could tell anything about it. In the distance, he saw the diminished dotted boat and then a swift gleam of bubbling white water and after that, nothing more. Whence it was concluded that the stricken whale must have indefinitely run away with his pursuers, as often happens. There was some apprehension, but no positive alarm as yet. The recall signals were placed in the riggings, darkness came on and forced to pick up her three far to windward boats Ere going in quest of the fourth one in the precisely opposite direction, the ship had not only been necessitated to leave that boat to its fate till midnight, but for the time to increase her distance from it. But the rest of her crew being at last safe aboard, she crowded all sail, stun sail on stun sail, after the missing boat, kindling a fire in her tripods for a beacon, and every other man aloft on the lookout. But though when she had thus sailed a sufficient distance to gain the presumed place of the absent ones when last seen, though she then paused to lower her spare boats to pull all around her, and not finding anything, had dashed again on, again paused, and lowered her boats, and though she had thus continued doing until daylight, yet not the least glimpse of the missing keel had been seen. The story told, the stranger captain immediately went on to reveal his object in boarding the Pequod. He desired that ship to unite with his own in the search. By sailing over the sea some four or five miles apart on parallel lines and so sweeping a double horizon as it were. I will wager something now, whispered Stubb to Flask, that someone in that missing boat wore off that captain's best coat mayhap his watch. He's so cursed anxious to get it back. Who's ever heard of two pious whale ships cruising after one missing whale boat in the height of the whaling season? See, Flask, only see how pale he looks, pale in the very buttons of his eyes. Look, it wasn't the coat. It must have been the... My boy, my own boy is among them. For God's sake, I beg, I conjure. Here exclaimed the stranger captain to Ahab, who thus far had but icily received his petition. For eight and forty hours, let me charter your ship. I will gladly pay for it and roundly pay for it. It must be no other way. For eight and forty hours only, only that, you must. Oh, you must, and you shall do this thing. His son, cried Stubb. Oh, it's his son he lost. I take back the coat and watch. What says Ahab? We must save that boy. He's drowned with the rest of them last night, said the old Manx sailor standing behind them. I heard. All of you heard their spirits. Now, as it shortly turned out, what made this incident of the Rachels the more melancholy was the circumstance that not only was one of the captain's sons among the number of the missing boat's crew, but among the number of the other boat's crews at the same time, but on the other hand, separated from the ship during the dark vicissitudes of the chase, there had been still another son, as that for a time the wretched father was plunged to the bottom of the cruelest perplexity which was only solved for him by his chief mates instinctively adopting the ordinance procedure of a whale ship in such emergencies, that is, when placed between jeopardize 
but divided boats, always to pick up the majority first. But the captain, for some unknown constitutional reason, had refrained from mentioning all of this, and not till forced to it by Ahab's iciness did he allude to his one yet missing boy, a little lad, but 12 years old, whose father, with the earnest but unmisgiving hardihood of a Nantucketer's paternal love, had thus early sought to initiate him in the perils and wonders of a vocation almost immemorially the destiny of all his race. Nor does it infrequently occur that Nantucket captains will send a son of such tender age away from them for a protracted three or four years voyage in some other ship than their own, so that their first knowledge of a whaleman's career shall be unevarated by any chance display of a father's natural but untimely partiality or undue apprehensiveness and concern. Meantime, now the stranger was still beseeching his poor boon of Ahab, and Ahab still stood like an anvil, receiving every shock but without the least quivering of his own. I will not go, said the stranger, till you say I to me. Do to me as you would have me do to you in like case. For you too have a boy, Captain Ahab, though but a child and nestling safely at home now, a child of your old age too. Yes, yes, you relent. I see it. Run, run, men, now, and stand by to square in the yards. Avast, cried Ahab, touch not a rope yarn. Then in a voice that prolongingly molded every word, Captain Gardiner, I will not do it. Even now I lose time. Goodbye, goodbye. God bless ye, man, and may I forgive myself, but I must go. Mr. Starbuck, look at the binnacle watch, and in three minutes from this present, instant wan off all strangers, then brace forward again and let the ship sail as before. Hurriedly turning, with averted face, he descended into his cabin, leaving the strange captain transfixed at this unconditional and utter rejection of his so earnest suit. But starting from his enchantment, Gardiner silently hurried to the side, more fell than stepped into his boat and returned to his ship. Soon the two ships diverged their wakes, and long as the strange vessel was in view, she was seen to yaw hither and thither at every dark spot, however small on the sea. This way and that her yards were swung around, starboard and larboard she continued to tack. Now she beat against a head sea, and again it pushed her before it, while all the while her mast and yards were thickly clustered with men, as three tall cherry trees when the boys are cherrying among the bows. But by her still halting course and winding woeful way, you plainly saw that this ship that so wept with spray still remained without comfort. She was Rachel, weeping for her children because they were not. Chapter 129 of The Cabin. Ahab moving to go on deck. Pip catches him by the hand to follow. Lad, lad, I tell thee, thou must not follow Ahab now. The hour is coming when Ahab would not scare thee from him, yet would not have thee by him. There is that in thee, poor lad, which I feel too curing to my malady. Like cures like, and for this hunt, my malady becomes my most desired health. Do thou abide below here, where they shall serve thee, as if thou wert the captain. I, lad, thou shalt sit here in my own screwed chair, another screw to it thou must be. No, 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 ye have not a whole body, sir. Do ye but use poor me for your one lost leg. Only tread upon me, sir. I ask no more, so I remain a part of ye. O oh, spite of million villains, this makes me a bigot in the fadeless fidelity of man, and a black, and a crazy, but methinks like cures like applies to him too, he grows so sane again. They tell me, sir, that Stubb did once desert poor little Pip, whose drowned bones now show white for all the blackness of his living skin. But I will never desert ye, sir, as Stubb did him. Sir, I must go with ye. 
If thou speakest thus to me much more, Ahab's purpose keels up in him. I tell thee, no, it cannot be. O oh, good master, 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 weep so, and I will murder thee. Have a care, for Ahab too is mad. Listen, and thou wilt often hear my ivory foot upon the deck, and still know that I am there. And now I quit thee, thy hand met. True art thou, lad, as the circumference to its center. So, God forever bless thee, and if it comes to that, God forever save thee. Let what will befall. Ahab goes. Pip steps one step forward. Here he this instant stood. I stand in his air, but I'm alone. Now were even poor Pip here, I could endure it. But he's missing. Pip! Pip! Ding, dong, ding! Who's seen Pip? He must be up here. Let's try the door. What? Neither lock, nor bolt, nor bar, and yet there's no opening it. It must be the spell. He told me to stay here. I. he told me this screwed chair was mine. Here, then, I'll seat me, against the transom, in the ship's full middle, all her keel and her three masts before me. Here, our old sailors say, in their black seventy-fours, great admirals sometimes sit at this table and lord it over rows of captains and lieutenants. Ha! What's this? Epaulets! Epaulets! The epaulets all coming, crowding. Pass round the decanters. Glad to see ye. Fill up, monsieur. What an odd feeling now when a black boy's host to white men with gold lace upon their coats. Monsieur, have you seen one pip? A little negro lad, five foot high, hangdog look, and cowardly. Jump from a whaleboat once, seen him? No? Well then, fill up, captains, and let's drink shame upon all cowards. I name no names. Shame upon them. One foot upon the table. Shame upon all cowards. Hist! Above there. I hear ivory. O oh, master, master, I am indeed downhearted when you walk over me. But here I'll stay though this stern strikes rocks, and they bulge through, and oysters come to join me. Passage 130. And now that at the proper time and place, after so long and wide a preliminary cruise, Ahab, all other wailing water swept, seemed to have chased his foe into an ocean fold, to slay him the more securely there. Now that he found himself hard by the very latitude and longitude where his tormenting wound had been inflicted, now that a vessel had been spoken which on the very day preceding had actually encountered Moby Dick, and now that all his successive meetings with various ships contrastingly concurred to show the demoniac indifference with which the white whale tore its hunters, whether sinning or sinned against. Now it was that there lurked a something in the old man's eyes, which was hardly sufferable for feeble souls to see. As the setting polar star, which through the livelong arctic six months night sustains its piercing, steady, central gaze, so Ahab's purpose now fixedly gleamed down upon the constant midnight of the gloomy crew. It do domineered above them so that all their bodings, doubts, misgivings, fears, were fain to hide behind their souls, and not sprout forth a single spear or leaf. In this foreshadowing interval, too, all humor, forced or natural, vanished. Stubb no more strove to raise a smile. Starbuck no more strove to check one. Alike, joy and sorrow, hope and fear, seemed ground to finest dust, and powdered for the time in the clamped mortar of Ahab's iron soul. Like machines, they dumbly moved about the deck, ever conscious that the old man's despot eye was on them. But did you deeply scan him in his more secret, confidential hours, when he thought no glance but one was on him? Then you would have seen that even as Ahab's eyes so awed the crew's, the inscrutable Parsi's glance awed his or somehow, at least, in some wild way, at times affected it. 
Such an added, gliding strangeness began to invest the thin Fadala now. Such ceaseless shudderings took him. The men looked dubious at him, half uncertain, as it seemed, whether indeed he were a mortal substance, or else a tremulous shadow, cast upon the deck by some unseen being's body. And that shadow was always hovering there. For not by night, even, had Fadala ever certainly been known to slumber or go below. He would stand still for hours, but never sat or leaned. His wan but wondrous eyes did plainly say, We two watchmen never rest. Nor at any time by night or day could the mariners now step upon the deck unless Ahab was before them, either standing in his pivot hole or exactly pacing the planks between two undeviating limits, the mainmast and the mizzen or else they saw him standing in the cabin scuttle, his living foot of advanced upon the deck as if to step. His hat slouched heavily over his eyes, so that however motionless he stood, however the days and nights were added on that he had not swung in his hammock, yet hidden beneath that slouching hat, they could never tell unerringly whether, for all this, his eyes were really closed at times, or whether he was still intently scanning them. No matter, though he stood so in the scuttle for a whole hour on the stretch, and the unheeded night damp gathered in beads of dew upon that stone-carved coat and hat, the clothes that the night had wet, the next, da next day's sunshine dried upon him. And so, day after day, and night after night, he went no more beneath the planks. Whatever he wanted from the cabin, that thing he sent for, he ate in the same open air, that is, his two only meals, breakfast and dinner. Supper he never touched, nor reaped his beard, which darkly grew all gnarled, as unearthed roots of trees blown over, which still grow idly on at the naked base, though perished in the upper verdure. But though his whole life was now become one watch on deck, and though the Parsi's mystic watch was without intermission as his own, yet these two never seemed to speak, one man to the other, unless at long intervals some passing, unmomentous matter made it necessary. Though such a potent spell seemed secretly to join the twain, openly and to the awestruck crew, they seemed pole like asunder. If by day they chanced to speak one word, by night dumb men were both as far as concerned the slightest verbal interchange. At times, for longest hours, without a single hail, they stood far parted in the starlight, Ahab and his scuttle, the Parsi by the mainmast, but still fixedly gazing upon each other, as if in the Parsi Ahab saw his forethrown shadow, in Ahab the Parsi his abandoned substance. And yet somehow did Ahab, in his own proper self, as daily, hourly, and every instant commandingly revealed to his subordinates, Ahab seemed an independent lord, the Parsi but his slave. Still again, both seem yoked together, and an unseen tyrant driving them, the lean shade siding the solid rib. For be this Parsi what he may, all rib and keel was solid Ahab. At the first faintest glimmering of the dawn, his iron voice was heard from aft, Man the mastheads! And all through the day, till after sunset and after twilight, the same voice every hour at the striking of the helmsman's bell was heard. What do you see? Sharp! Sharp! But when three or four days had slided by after meeting the children seeking Rachel, and no spout had yet been seen, the monomaniac old man seemed distrustful of his crew's fidelity, at least of nearly all except the pagan harpooners. He seemed to doubt even whether Stubb and Flask might not willingly overlook the sight he sought. But if these suspicions were really his, he sagaciously refrained from verbally expressing them, however his actions might seem to hint them. "'I will have the first sight of the whale myself,' he said. "'I, Ahab, must have the doubloon!' And with his own hands he rigged a nest of basketed bolands and sent a hand aloft with a single sheaved block to secure to the mainmast head. He received the two ends of the downward reeved rope and attaching one to his basket prepared a pin for the other end in order to fasten it at the rail. This done, with that end yet in his hand, and standing beside the pin, he looked round upon his crew, sweeping from one to the other, 
pausing his glance upon Dagu, Queequeg, Tashtigo, but shunning Fadala, and then settling his firm, relying eye upon the chief mate, said, Take the rope, sir. I give it into thy hands, Starbuck. Then arranging his person in the basket, he gave the word for them to hoist into his perch, Starbuck being the one who secured the rope at last, and afterwards stood near it. And thus, with one hand clinging round the royal mast, Ahab gazed abroad upon the sea for miles and miles, ahead, astern, this side and that, within the wide, expanded circle, commanded at so great a height. When in working with his hands at some lofty, almost isolated place in the rigging, which chances to afford no foothold, the sailor at sea is hoisted up to that spot, and sustained there by the rope. Under these circumstances, its fastened end on deck is always given in strict charge to some one man who has the special watch of it, because in such a wilderness of running rigging, these various different relations aloft cannot always be infallibly discerned by what is seen of them at the deck. And when the deck ends of these ropes are being every few minutes cast down from the fastenings, it would be but a natural fatality if, unprovided with a constant watchman, the hoisted sailor should by some carelessness of the crew be cast adrift and fall all swooping to the sea. So Ahab's proceedings in this matter were not unusual. The only strange thing about them seemed to be that Starbuck, almost the only one man who had ever ventured to oppose him with anything in the slightest degree approaching to decision, one of those two whose faithfulness on the lookout he had seemed to doubt somewhat. It was strange that this was the very man he should select for his watchman, freely giving his whole life into such an otherwise distrusted person's hands. Now the first time Ahab was perched aloft, ere he had been there ten minutes, one of those red-billed savage seahawks, which so often fly incommodiously close round the man-mastheads of whalemen in these latitudes, one of these birds came wheeling and screaming around his head in a maze of untrackably swift circlings. Then it darted a thousand feet straight up into the air, then spiralized downwards and went eddying again around his head. But with his gaze fixed upon the dim and distant horizon, Ahab seemed not to mark this wild bird. Nor indeed would anyone else have marked it much, it being no uncommon circumstance. Only now, almost the least heedful eye seemed to see some sort of cunning meaning in almost every sight. "'Your hat! Your hat, sir!' suddenly cried the Sicilian seaman, who, being posted at the mizzen masthead, stood directly behind Ahab, though somewhat lower than his level, and with a deep gulf of air dividing them. But already the sable wing was before the old man's eyes, the long-hooked bill at his head. With a scream, the black hawk darted away with his prize. An eagle flew thrice round Tarquin's head, removing his cap to replace it, and thereupon Tanaquil, his wife, declared that Tarquin would be king of Rome. But only by the replacing of the cap was that omen accounted good. Ahab's hat was never restored. The wild hawk flew on and on with it, far in advance of the prow, and at last disappeared, while from the point of that disappearance a minute black spot was dimly discerned, falling from that vast height into the sea. This is chapter 131. The Pequod Meets the Delight. The intense Pequod sailed on, the rolling waves and days went by, the lifebuoy coffin still lightly swung, and another ship most miserably misnamed the Delight was descried. As she drew nigh, all eyes were fixed upon her broad beams, called shears, which, in some whaling ships, crossed the quarter-deck at the height of eight or nine feet, serving to carry the spare, unrigged, or disabled boats. Upon the stranger's shears were beheld the shattered white ribs and some few splintered planks of what had once been a whaleboat. But you now saw through this wreck as plainly as you see through the peeled, half unhinged and bleaching skeleton of a horse. Hast seen the white whale? Look, replied the hollow-cheeked captain from his taffrail, and with his trumpet he pointed to the wreck. Hast killed him? The harpoon is not yet forged that will ever do that, answered the other, sadly glancing upon a rounded hammock on the deck, 
whose gathered sides some noiseless sailors were busy in sewing together, not forged, and snatching Perth's leveled iron from the crotch, Ahab held it out, exclaiming, Look ye, Nantucketer, here in this hand I hold his death. Tempered in blood and tempered by lightning are these barbs, and I swear to temper them triply in that hot place behind the fin, where the white whale most feels his accursed life. Then keep thee, old man, seest thou that, pointing to the hammock, I bury but one of five stout men, who were alive only yesterday, but were dead ere night. Only that one I bury. The rest were buried before they died. You sail upon their tomb. Then turning to his crew, Are you ready there? Place the plank then on the rail, and lift the body. So then, O oh God, advancing towards the hammock with uplifted hands, may the resurrection and the life Brace forward, up helm, cried Ahab, like lightning to his men. But the suddenly started Pequod was not quick enough to escape the sound of the splash that the corpse soon made as it struck the sea. Not so quick indeed, but that some of the flying bubbles might, be, might have sprinkled her hull with their ghostly baptism. As Ahab now glided from the dejected delight, the strange life boy hanging at the Pequod's stern came into conspicuous relief. Ha, ah, yonder, look yonder, men, cried a foreboding voice in her wake. In vain, O oh, ye strangers, ye fly our sad burial. Ye but turn us your taffrail to show us your coffin. It was a clear, steel-blue day. The firmaments of air and sea were hardly separable in that all-pervading azure. Only the pensive air was transparently pure and soft with a woman's look, and the robust and manlike sea heaved with long, strong, lingering swells as Samson's chest in his sleep. Hither and thither, on high, glided the snow-white wings of small, unspeckled birds. These were the gentle thoughts of the feminine air. But to and fro in the deeps, far down in the bottomless blue, rushed mighty leviathans, swordfish, and sharks. And these were the strong, troubled, murderous thinkings of the masculine sea. But though thus contrasting within, the contrast was only in shades and shadows without. Those two seemed one. It was only the sex, as it were, that distinguished them. Aloft, like a royal czar and king, the sun seemed giving this gentle air to this bold and rolling sea, even as a bride to groom. And at the girdling line of the horizon, a soft and tremulous motion, most seen here at the equator, denoted the fond, throbbing thrust, the loving alarms with which the poor bride gave her bosom away. Tied up and twisted, gnarled and knotted with wrinkles, haggardly firm and unyielding, his eyes glowing like coals that still glow in the ashes of ruin, Untottering Ahab stood forth in the clearness of the morn, lifting his splintered helmet of a brow to the fair girl's forehead of heaven. O oh, immortal infancy and innocency of the azure, invisible winged creatures that frolic all around us, sweet childhood of air and sky, how oblivious were ye of old Ahab's close-coiled woe! But so have I seen little Miriam and Martha, laughing-eyed elves, heedlessly gambol around their old sire, sporting with the circle of singed locks which grew on the marge of that burnt-out crater of his brain. Slowly crossing the deck from the scuttle, Ahab leaned over the side and watched how his shadow in the water sank and sank to his gaze, the more and the more that he strove to pierce the profundity. But the lovely aromas in that enchanted air did at last seem to dispel for a moment the cantankerous thing in his soul. That glad, happy air, that winsome sky, did at last stroke and caress him, the stepmother world, so long cruel, forbidding, now threw affectionate arms round his stubborn neck, and did seem to joyously sob over him, as if over one that, however willful and erring, she could yet find it in her heart to save and to bless. From beneath his slouched hat, Ahab dropped a tear into the sea, nor did all the Pacific contain such wealth as that one wee drop. Starbuck saw the old man, saw him, how he heavily leaned over the side, and he seemed to hear in his own true heart the measureless sobbing that stole out of the center of the serenity around. Careful not to touch him or be noticed by him, he yet drew near to him and stood there. Ahab turned. Starbuck! Sir! Oh, Starbuck, it is a mild, mild wind and a mild-looking sky. On such a day, very much such a sweetness as this, I struck my first whale, a boy harpooner at eighteen. Forty, forty, forty years ago, ago! Forty years of continual wailing, forty years of privation and peril and storm time, forty years on the pitiless sea, 
For 40 years has Ahab forsaken the peaceful land, for 40 years to make war on the horrors of the deep. I, and yes, Starbuck, out of those 40 years, I have not spent three ashore. When I think of this life I have led, the desolation of solitude it has been, the masoned walled town of a captain's exclusiveness, which admits but small entrance to any sympathy from the green country without. Oh, weariness, heaviness, Guinea coast slavery of solitary command. When I think of all this, only half suspected, not so keenly known to me before, and how for 40 years I have fed upon dry salted fare, fit emblem of the dry nourishment of my soul. When the poorest landsman has had fresh fruit to his daily hand and broken the world's fresh bread to my moldy crusts, Away, whole oceans away from that young girl wife I wedded past fifty and sailed for Cape Horn the next day, leaving but one dent in my marriage pillow. Wife? Wife? Rather a widow with her husband alive. Aye, I widowed that poor girl when I married her, Starbuck. And then, the madness, the frenzy, the boiling blood and the smoking brow, for which for a thousand lowerings old Ahab has furiously, foamingly chased his prey. More a demon than a man. Aye, aye, what a forty years fool. Fool, old fool, as old Ahab been, why this strife of the chase? Why weary and palsy the arm at the oar and the iron and the lance? How the richer or better is Ahab now? Behold, O oh, Starbuck, it is not hard that with this weary load I bear, one poor leg should have been snatched from under me. Here, brush this old hair aside. It blinds me that I seem to weep. Locks so grey did never grow but from out some ashes. But do I look very old, so very, very old, Starbuck? I feel deadly faint, bowed and humped, as though I were Adam staggering beneath the piled centuries since paradise. God, 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 crack my heart, stave my brain, mockery, mockery, bitter, biting mockery of gray hairs. Have I lived through enough joy to wear ye, and seem and feel thus intolerably old? Close, stand close to me, Starbuck. Let me look into a human eye. It is better than to gaze into sea or sky, better than to gaze upon God, by the green land, by the bright hearthstone. This is the magic glass, man. I see my wife and my child in thine eye. No, no, stay on board, on board. Lower not when I do. When branded Ahab gives chase to Moby Dick, that hazard shall not be thine. No, no, not with the faraway home I see in that eye. Oh, my captain, my captain, noble soul, grand old heart, after all, why should anyone give chase to that hated fish? Away with me, let us fly these deadly waters. Let us home. Wife and child, too, are Starbucks. Wife and child of his brotherly, sisterly, playfellow youth. Even as thine, sir, the wife and child of thy loving, longing, paternal old age. Away, let us away. This instant, let me alter the course. How cheerily, how hilariously, oh, my captain, would we bowl on our way to see old Nantucket again? I think, sir, they have some such mild blue days even as this in Nantucket. They have, they have, I have seen them, some summer days in the morning. About this time, yes, it is his new nap now. The boy vivaciously wakes, sits up in bed, and his mother tells him of me, cannibal old me, how I am abroad upon the deep, but will yet come back to dance him again. Tis my Mary, my Mary herself. She promised that my boy every morning should be carried to the hill to catch the first glimpse of his father's sail. Yes, yes, no more, it is done. We head for Nantucket. Come on, my captain, study out the course, and let us away. See, see the boy's face from the window, the boy's hand on the hill. But Ahab's glance was averted. Like a blighted fruit tree, he shook and cast his last cindered apple to the soil. What is it? What nameless, inscrutable, unearthly thing is it? What cousining, hidden lord and master and cruel, remorseless emperor commands me? But against all natural longings and lovings, I so keep pushing and crowding, and jamming myself on all the time, recklessly making me ready to do what in my own proper natural heart I durst not so much as dare. Is Ahab Ahab? Is it I, God, or who that lifts this arm? But if the great sun move not of himself, but is an errand boy in heaven, nor one single star can revolve but by some invisible power, how then can this one small heart beat, this one small brain think thoughts, unless God does that beat him? Does that thinking, does that living, and not I? By heaven, man, we are turned round and round in this world like your dear windlass, and fate is the handspike. And all the time, lo, that smiling sky and this unsounded sea. Look, see on Albacore? Who put it into him to chase and fang that flying fish? Where do murderers go, man? 
Who's to doom when the judge himself is dragged to the bar? But it is a mild, mild wind and a mild-looking sky. And the air smells now as if it blew from a faraway meadow. They have been making hay somewhere under the slopes of the Andes, Starbuck. And the mowers are sleeping among the new-mown hay. Sleeping? Aye, toil how we may. We all sleep at last on the field. Sleep? Aye, and rust amid greenness. As last year's size flung down and left in the half-cut swaths, Starbuck. But blanched to a corpse's hue with despair, the mate had stolen away. Ahab crossed the deck to gaze over on the other side, but started at two reflected fixed eyes in the water there. Fadala was motionlessly leaning over the same rail. Chapter 133, The Chase, First Day. That night in the mid-watch when the old man, as his wont at intervals, stepped forth from the scuttle in which he leaned and went to his pivot hole, he suddenly thrust out his face fiercely, snuffing up the sea air as a sagacious ship's dog will in drawing nigh to some barbarous isle. He declared that a whale must be near. Soon that peculiar odor, sometimes to a great distance given forth by the living sperm whale, was palpable to all the watch. Nor was any mariner surprised when after inspecting the compass and then the dog vane and then ascertaining the precise bearing of the odor as nearly as possible, Ahab rapidly ordered the ship's course to be slightly altered and the sail to be shortened. The acute policy dictating these movements was sufficiently vindicated at daybreak by the sight of a long sleek on the sea, directly and lengthwise ahead, smooth as oil and resembling in the pleated watery wrinkles bordering it, the polished metallic-like marks of some swift tide rip at the mouth of a deep rapid stream. Man the mastheads, call all hands thundering with the butts of three clubbed handspikes on the forecastle deck, Dagu roused the sleepers with such judgment claps that they seemed to exhale from the scuttle, so instantaneously did they appear with their clothes in their hands. What do you see? cried Ahab, flattening his face to the sky. Nothing, nothing, sir, was the sound hailing down in reply. To gallant sails, stunsels, allow and aloft and on both sides. All sail being set, he now cast loose the lifeline reserved for swaying him to the main royal masthead. And in a few moments they were hoisting him thither when while two thirds of the way aloft and while peering ahead through the horizontal vacancy between the main top sail and the top gallant sail, he raised a gull-like cry in the air. There she blows. There she blows, a hump like a snow hill. It is Moby Dick. Fired by the cry which seemed simultaneously taken up by the three lookouts, the men on deck rushed to the rigging to behold the famous whale they had so long been pursuing. Ahab had now gained his final perch some feet above the other lookouts, Tashtego standing just beneath him on the cap of the top gallant mast so that the Indian's head was almost on a level with Ahab's heel. From this height, the whale was now seen some mile or so ahead at every roll of the sea revealing his high sparkling hump and regularly jetting his silent spout into the air. To the credulous mariners, it seemed the same silent spout they had so long ago beheld in the moonlit Atlantic and Indian oceans. And did none of ye see it before, cried Ahab, hailing the perched men all around him. I saw him almost the same instant, sir, as the, cap as the Captain Ahab did, and I cried out, said Tashtego. Not the same instant, not the same, no. The doubloon is mine. Fate reserved the doubloon for me. I only, none of ye could have raised the white whale first. There she blows, there she blows, there she blows, there again, there again, he cried in long drawn lingering methodic tones attuned to the gradual prolongings of the whale's visible jets. 
He's going to sound. In stunsels, down top gallant sails. Stand by three boats. Mr. Starbuck, remember, stay on board and keep the ship. Helm there. Luff, luff a point. So, steady man, steady. There go flukes. No, no, only black water. Already the boats there? Stand by, stand by. Lower me, Mr. Starbuck. Lower, lower, quicker, quicker. And he slid through the air to the deck. He's heading straight to leeward, sir, cried Stubb, right away from us. Cannot have seen the ship yet. Be dumb, man, stand by the braces, hard down the helm, brace up, shiver her, shiver her. So well that, boats, boats. Soon all the boats but Starbucks were dropped, all of the boat sails set, all of the paddles plying with rippling swiftness shooting to leeward and Ahab heading the onset. A pale death glimmer lit up Fidala's sunken eyes, a hideous motion gnawed his teeth. Like noiseless nautilus shells, their light prows spread, sped through the sea, but only slowly they neared the foe. As they neared him, the ocean grew still more smooth, seemed drawing a carpet over its waves, seemed a noon meadow, so serenely it spread. At length, the breathless hunter came so nigh his seemingly unsuspecting prey that his entire dazzling hump was distinctly visible, sliding along the sea as if an isolated thing and continually set in a revolving ring of finest fleecy greenish foam. He saw the vast involved wrinkles of the slightly projecting head beyond. Before it, far out uh, on the soft Turkish rugged waters went the glistening white shadow from his broad milky forehead a musical rippling playfully accompanying the shade and behind the blue waters interchangeably flowed over into the moving valley of his steady wake. And on either hand, bright bubbling or bubblings, <laughs> on the other ha either hand, bright bubbles arose and danced by his side. But these were broken again by the light toes of a hundred of gay, of hundreds of gay fowl softly feathering the sea, alternate with their fitful flight. And like some flagstaff rising from the painted hull of an argosy, the tall but shattered pole of a recent lance projected from the white whale's back. And at intervals, one of the cloud soft toed fowls hovering to and fro skimming like a canopy over the fish, silently perched and rocked on this pole, the long tail feathers streaming like pennons. A gentle joyousness, a mighty mildness of repose in swiftness invested the gliding whale, not the white bull Jupiter swimming away with ravished Europa clinging to his graceful horns, his lovely leering eyes sideways intent upon the maid with smooth bewishing fleetness rippling straight for the nuptial bower in Crete. Not Jove, not that great majesty supreme did surpass the glorified white whale as he so divinely swam. On each soft side, coincident with the parted swell that but once leaving him then flowed so wide away. On each bright side, the whale shut off enticings. No wonder there had been some among the hunters who namelessly transported and allured by all this serenity had ventured to assail it, but had fatally found that quietude but the vesture of tornadoes. Yet calm, enticing calm, O oh whale, thou glidest on to all who for the first time eye thee, no matter how many in that same way thou mayest have be juggled and destroyed before. And thus, through the ser serene tranquilities of the tropical sea, 
among the waves whose hand clappings were suspended by exceeding rapture, Moby Dick moved on, still withholding from sight the full terrors of his submerged trunk, entirely hiding the wretched hideousness of his jaw. But soon the fore part of him rose, slowly rose from the water. For an instant, his whole marbleized body, body formed a high arch like Virginia's natural bridge and warningly waved his bannered flukes in the air. The grand God himself, the grand God revealed himself, sounded and went out of sight hoveringly halting and dipping on the wing, the white sea fowls longingly lingered over the agitated pool that he left. With oars a peak and paddles down, the sheets of their sails adrift, the three boats now stilly floated, awaiting Moby Dick's reappearance. An hour, said Ahab, standing rooted in the boat's stern, and he gazed beyond the whale's place towards the dim blue spaces and wide wooing vacancies to leeward. It was only for an instant, for again his eyes seemed whirling round in his head as he swept the watery circle. The breeze now freshened, the sea began to swell. The birds, the birds, cried Teshtego. In long Indian file, as when herons take wing, the white birds were now all flying towards Ahab's boat, and when within a few yards began fluttering over the water there, wheeling round and round with joyous expectant cries. Their vision was keener than man's. Ahab could discover no sign in the sea, but suddenly, as he peered down and down into its depths, he profoundly saw a white living spot, no bigger than a white weasel, with wonderful celerity uprising and magnifying as it rose till it turned, and then there were plainly revealed two long, crooked rows of white, glistening teeth floating up from the undiscoverable bottom. It was Moby Dick's open mouth and scrolled jaw, his vast shadowed bulk still half blending with the blue of the sea. The glittering mouth yawned beneath the boat like an open-doored marble tomb, and giving one sidelong sweep with his steering oar, Ahab whirled the craft aside from this tremendous apparition. Then, calling upon Fadala to change places with him, went forward to the bows, and seizing Perth's harpoon, commanded his crew to grasp their oars and stand by to stern. Now, by reason of this timely spinning round the boat upon its axis, its bow by anticipation was made to face the whale's head while yet underwater. But as if perceiving this stratagem, Moby Dick, with that malicious intelligence ascribed to him, sidlingly transplanted himself, as it were, in an instant shooting his pleated head lengthwise beneath the boat. Through and through, through every plank and each rib, it thrilled for an instant, the whale obliquely lying on his back in the manner of a biting shark, slowly and unfeelingly taking its bowels full within his mouth so that the long, narrow, scrolled lower jaw curled high up in the open air and one of the teeth caught in a rowlock. The bluish pearl white of the inside of the jaw was only six inches of Ahab's head and reached higher than that. In this attitude, the white whale now shook the slight cedar as a mildly cruel cat her mouse. With unastonished eyes, Fidela gazed and crossed his arms. But the tiger yellow crew were tumbling out over each other's heads to gain the uppermost stern. And now, while both elastic gunnels were springing in and out as the whale dallied with the doomed craft in this devilish way, and from his body being submerged beneath the boat, he could not be darted at from the bows, for the bows were almost inside of him, as it were. And while the other boats involuntarily paused, as before a quick crisis impossible to withstand, then it was that monomaniac Ahab, furious with this tantalizing vicinity of his foe, which placed him all alive and helpless in the very jaws he hated. Frenzied with all this, he seized the long bone with his naked hands and wildly strove to wrench it from its gripe. And now he thus vainly strove, the jaw slipped from him, the frail gunnels bent in, collapsed, and snapped as both jaws like an enormous shears sliding further aft 
bit the craft completely in twain and locked themselves fast again in the sea midway between the two floating wrecks. These floated aside, the broken ends drooping, the crew at the stern wreck clinging to the gunnels and striving to hold fast to the oars to lash them across. At that preluding moment, ere the boat was yet snapped, Ahab, the first to perceive the whale's intent by the crafty upraising of his head, a movement that loosed his hold for the time, and at that moment his hand had made one final effort to push the boat out of the bite, but only slipping further into the whale's mouth and tilting over sideways as it slipped, the boat had shaken off his hold on the jaw, spilled him out of it, and leaned to the push, and so he fell flat-faced upon the sea. Ripplingly withdrawing from his prey, Moby Dick now lay at a little distance, vertically thrusting his oblong white head up and down in the billows, and at the same time slowly revolving his whole spindled body so that when his vast wrinkled forehead rose some twenty or more feet out of the water, the now rising swells with all their confluent waves dazzlingly broke against it, vindictively tossing their shivered spray still higher into the air. Footnote. This motion is peculiar to the sperm whale. It receives its designation, pitch polling, from its being likened to that preliminary up and down poise of the whale lance in the exercise called pitch polling previously described. By this motion, the whale must best and most comprehensively view whatever objects may be encircling him. So, in a gale, the but half baffled channel billows only recoil from the base of the eddy stone, triumphantly to overleap its summit with their scud. But soon resuming his horizontal attitude, Moby Dick swam swiftly round and round the wrecked crew, sideways churning the water in his vengeful wake as if lashing himself up to still another and more deadly assault. The sight of the splintered boat seemed to madden him as the blood of grapes and mulberries cast before Antiochus elephants in the Book of Maccabees. Meanwhile, Ahab, half smothered in the foam of the whale's insolent tail and too much of a cripple to swim, though he could still keep afloat even in the heart of such a whirlpool as that, helpless Ahab's head was seen like a tossed bubble which the least chance shook might burst. From the boat's fragmentary stern, Fadala incuriously and mildly eyed him. The clinging crew at the drifting end could not succor him. More than enough was it for them to look to themselves. For so revolvingly appalling was the white whale's aspect, and so planetarily swift the ever-contracting circles he made that he seemed horizontally swooping upon them. And though the other boats, unharmed, still hovered hard by, still they dared not pull into the eddy to strike, lest that should be the signal for the instant destruction of the jeopardized castaways, Ahab and all. Nor in that case could they themselves hope to escape. With straining eyes, then, they remained on the outer edge of the direful zone, whose center had now become the old man's head. Meantime, from the beginning, all this had been descried from the ship's mastheads, and squaring her yards she had borne down upon the scene was now so nigh that Ahab in the water hailed her. Sail on, the but at that moment a breaking sea dashed on him from Moby Dick and whelmed him for the time, but... Struggling out of it again and chancing to rise on a towering crest, he shouted, Sail on the whale! Drive him off! The Picard's prows were pointed, and breaking up the charmed circle, she effectually parted the white whale from his victim. As he sullenly swam off, the boats flew to the rescue. Dragged into Stubb's boat with bloodshot blinded eyes, the white brine caking in his wrinkles, the long tension of Ahab's bodily strength did crack, and helplessly he yielded to his body's doom for a time, lying all crushed in the bottom of Stubb's boat like one trodden underfoot of herds of elephants. Far inland, nameless wails came from him as desolate sounds from out ravines. But this intensity of his physical prostration did but so much more abbreviate it. In an instant's compass, great hearts sometimes condense to one deep pang, the sum total of those shallow pains, kindly diffused through feebler men's whole lives. And so such hearts, through summary and each one suffering, still, if the gods decree it, in their lifetime, aggregate a whole age of woe, wholly made up of instantaneous int intensities. 
for even in their pointless centers, those noble natures contain the entire circumferences of inferior souls. The harpoon, said Ahab, halfway rising and draggingly leaning on one bended arm. Is it safe? Aye, sir, for it was not darted. This is it, said Stubb, showing it. Lay it before me. Any missing men? One, two, three, four, five. There were five oars, sir, and there are five men. That's good. Help me, man. I wish to stand. So, so I see him. There, there, going leeward still. What a leaping spout. Hands off me. The eternal sap runs up in Ahab's bones again. Set the sail. Out oars. The helm. It's often in the case that when a boat is stove, its crew, being picked up by another boat, help to work that second boat, and the chase is thus continued with what's called double-banked oars. It was thus now, but the added power of the boat did not equal the added power of the whale, for he seemed to have treble-banked his every fin, swimming with a velocity which plainly showed that if now under these circumstances pushed on, the chase would prove an indefinitely prolonged, if not hopeless, one. Nor could any crew endure for so long a period in such an unintermitted, intense straining at the oar, or a thing barely tolerable only in some one brief vicissitude. The ship itself then, as it sometimes happens, offered the most promising intermediate means of overtaking the chase. Accordingly, the boats now made for her and were soon swayed upon to their cranes, the two parts of the wrecked boat having been previously secured by her, and then hoisting everything to her side and stacking her canvas high up and sideways outstretching it with stun sails like the double-jointed wings of an albatross. The Pequod bore down in the leeward wake of Moby Dick. At the well-known methodic intervals, the whale's glittering spout was regularly announced from the manned mastheads, and when he would be reported as just gone down, Ahab would take the time, and then pacing the deck binnacle watch in his hand, so soon as the last of the allotted hour expired, his voice was heard. Who's Whose is the doubloon now? Do you see him? And if the reply was no, sir, straight away he commanded them to lift him to his perch. In this way the day wore on, Ahab now aloft and motionless, anon unrestingly pacing the, pr- the planks. As he was thus walking, uttering no sound except to hail men aloft or to bid them hoist a sail still higher or to spread one to a still greater breadth, thus to and fro pacing beneath his slouched hat. At every turn he passed his own wrecked boat, which had been dropped upon the quarter deck and lay there reversed, broken bow to shattered stern. At last he paused before it, and, as in an already overclouded sky, fresh troops of clouds will sometimes sail across, so over the old man's face were now stole some such added gloom as this. Stubb saw him pause, and perhaps intending not vainly, though, to evince his own unabated fortitude, and thus keep up a valiant place in his captain's mind, he advanced, and eyeing the wreck, exclaimed, The thistle the ass refused. It pricked in his mouth too keenly, Cern. Ha ha! What a soulless thing is this that laughs before a wreck! Man! Man! Did I not know thee brave as fearless fire, and as mechanical, I could swear you were a poltroon. Groan nor laugh should be heard before a wreck. Ay, sir, said Starbuck, drawing near, tis a solemn sight, an omen and an ill one. Omen, omen, the dictionary. If the gods think to speak outright to man, they will honorably speak outright, not shake their heads and give an old wife's darkling hint. Be gone. Ye two are opposite poles of one thing. Starbuck is stub reversed, and stub is Starbuck. And ye two are all mankind, and Ahab stands alone among the millions of peopled earth, nor gods nor men his neighbors. Cold, cold, I shiver. How now? Aloft there, do you see him? Sing out for every spout, though he spout ten times a second. 
The day was nearly done. Only the hem of his golden robe was bustling. Soon it was almost dark, but the lookout men still remained unset. Can't see the spout now, sir. Too dark, cried a voice from the air. How heading last seen? As before, sir, straight leeward. Good. He will travel slower now tis night. Down royals and top gallant stunsaw sails, Mr. Starbuck. We must not run over him before morning. He's making a passage now and may heave to a while. Helm there, keep her full before the wind. Aloft, come down. Mr. Stubb, send a fresh hand to the foremast head and see it manned until morning. Then advancing toward the doubloon and the main mast, men, this gold is mine for I earned it, but I shall let it abide there till the white whale is dead. And then whosoever of ye raises, first raises him, Upon the day he shall be killed, this gold is that man's. And if on that day I shall raise him, I shall again raise him, then ten times its sum shall be divided among all of ye. Away now, the deck is thine, sir. And so saying, he placed himself halfway within the scuttle and slouching his hat, stood there till dawn, except when at intervals rousing himself to see how the night wore on. Chapter 134, The Chase, Second Day. At daybreak, the three mastheads were punctually manned afresh. Do you see him, cried Ahab, after allowing a little space for the light to spread? See nothing, sir. Turn up all hands and make sail. He travels faster than I thought for. The top gallant sails. Aye, they should have been kept on her all night. But no matter, tis but resting for the rush. Here be it said that this pertinacious pursuit of one particular whale, continued through day into night and through night into day, is a thing by no means unprecedented in the South Sea fishery. For such is the wonderful skill, prescience of experience, and invincible confidence acquired by some great natural geniuses among the Nantucket commanders, that from the simple observation of a whale when last descried, they will, under certain given circumstances, pretty accurately foretell both the direction in which he will continue to swim for a time while out of sight, as well as his probable rate of progression during that period. And in these cases, somewhat as a pilot, when about losing sight of a coast, whose general trending he well knows and which he desires shortly to return to again, but at some further point, like as this pilot stands by his compass and takes the precise bearing of the cape at present visible, in order the more certainly to hit aright the remote, unseen headland eventually to be visited, so does the fisherman at his compass with the whale. For after being chased and diligently marked through several hours of daylight, then, when night obscures the fish, the creature's future wake through the darkness is almost as established to the sagacious mind of the hunter as the pilot's coast is to him so that to this hunter's wondrous skill, the proverbial evanescence of a thing writ in water, awake, is to all desired purposes well nigh as reliable as the steadfast land. And as the mighty iron leviathan of the modern railway is so familiarly known in its every pace, that with watches in their hands, men time his rate as doctors that of a baby's pulse, and lightly say of it, the up train or the down train will reach such or such a spot at such or such an hour. Even so, almost, there are occasions when these Nantucketers time that other leviathan of the deep, according to the observed humor of his speed, and say to themselves, so many hours hence this whale will have gone 200 miles, will have about reached this or that degree of latitude or longitude. But to render this acuteness at all successful in the end, the wind and the sea must be the whale man's allies. For of what present avail to the becalmed or wind-bound mariner is the skill that assures him he is exactly 93 leagues and a quarter from his port? Inferable from these statements are many collateral, subtle matters touching the chase of whales. The ship tore on, leaving such a furrow in the sea as when a cannonball, missent, becomes a plowshare and turns up the level field. By salt and hemp, cried Stubb, but this swift motion of the deck creeps up one's legs and tingles at the heart. This ship and I are two brave fellows, ha ha. Someone take me up and launch me spine-wise on the sea, for by live oaks my spine's a keel. 
Ha ha, we go the gate that leaves no dust behind. There she blows, she blows, she blows, right ahead, was now the masthead cry. Aye, aye, cried Stubb, I knew it, you can't escape. Blow on and split your spout, O oh whale, the mad fiend himself is after you. Blow your trumpet, blister your lungs, Ahab will dam off your blood as a miller shuts his water gate upon the stream. And Stubb did but speak out for well nigh all that crew. The frenzies of the chase had by this time worked them bubblingly up, like old wine worked anew. Whatever pale fears and forebodings some of them might have felt before, these were not only now kept out of sight through the growing awe of Ahab, but they were broken up and on all sides routed as timid prairie hares that scatter before the bounding bison. The hand of fate had snatched all their souls, and by the stirring perils of the previous day, the rack of the past night's suspense, the fixed, unfearing, blind, reckless way in which their wild craft went plunging toward its flying mark, by all these things their hearts were bowled along. The wind that made great bellies of their sails and rushed the vessel on by arms invisible as irresistible. This seemed the symbol of that unseen agency which so enslaved them to the race. They were one man, not thirty, for as the one ship that held them all, though it was put together of all contrasting things, oak and maple and pinewood, iron and pitch and hemp, yet all these ran into each other in the one concrete hull, which shot on its way, both balanced and directed by the long central keel. Even so, all the individualities of the crew, this man's valor, that man's fear, guilt and guiltiness, all varieties were welded into oneness and were all directed to that fatal goal which Ahab, their one lord and keel, did point to. The rigging lived, the mastheads like the tops of tall palms were outspreadingly tufted with arms and legs. Clinging to a spar with one hand, some reached forth the other with impatient wavings, others, shading their eyes from the vivid sunlight, sat far out on the rocking yards, all the spars in full bearing of mortals, ready and ripe for their fate. Ah, how they still strove through that infinite blueness to seek out the thing that might destroy them. Why sing ye not out for him if you see him, cried Ahab, when, after a lapse of some minutes since the first cry, no more had been heard. Sway me up, men. Ye have been deceived. Not Moby Dick casts one odd jet that way and then disappears. It was even so. In their headlong eagerness, the men had mistaken some other thing for the whale spout, as the event itself soon proved. For hardly had Ahab reached his perch, hardly was the rope belayed to its pin on deck, when he struck the keynote to an orchestra that made the air vibrate as with the combined discharges of rifles. The triumphant halloo of thirty buckskin lungs was heard, as much nearer to the ship than the place of the imaginary jet less than a mile away, Moby Dick bodily burst into view. For not by any calm and indolent spoutings, not by the peaceable gush of that mystic fountain in his head did the white whale now reveal his vicinity, but by the far more wondrous phenomenon of breaching. Rising with his utmost velocity from the furthest depths, the sperm whale thus booms his entire bulk into the pure element of the air, and piling up a mountain of dazzling foam, shows his place to the distance of seven miles and more. In, the, in those moments, the torn, enraged waves he shakes off seem his mane. In some cases, this breaching is his act of defiance. There she breaches! There she breaches! was the cry, as in his immeasurable bravados, the white whale tossed himself salmon-like to the heavens. So suddenly seen in the blue plain of the sea and relieved against the still bluer margin of the sky, the spray that he raised for the moment intolerably glittered and glared like a glacier and stood there gradually fading and fading away from its first sparkling intensity to the dim mistiness of an advancing shower in a veil. I breach your lust to the sun, Moby Dick, cried Ahab. Thy hour and thy harpoon are at hand. Down, down, all of you, but one man at the fore. The boats stand by. Unmindful of the tedious rope ladders of the shrouds, the men, like shooting stars, slid to the deck, 
by the isolated backstays and halyards, while Ahab, less dartingly but still rapidly, was dropped from his perch. Lower away, he cried, so soon as he had reached his boat, a spare one rigged the afternoon previous. Mr. Starbuck, the ship is thine. Keep away from the boats, but keep near them. Lower all. As if to strike a quick terror into them, by this time being the first assailant himself, Moby Dick had turned and was now coming for the three crews. Ahab's boat was central and cheering his men. He told them he would take the whale head and head, that is, pull straight up to his forehead, a not uncommon thing, for when within a certain limit, such a course excludes the coming onset from the whale's sidelong vision. But ere that close limit was gained, and while yet all three boats were plain as the ship's three masts to his eye, the white whale churning himself into furious speed, almost in an incident, as it were, rushing among the boats with open jaws and a lashing tail, offered appalling battle on every side, and heedless of the irons darted at him from every boat, seemed only intent on annihilating each separate plank of which these boats were made, but skillfully maneuvered, incessantly wheeling like trained chargers in the field, the boats for a while eluded him, though at times but by a plank's breadth, while all the time Ahab's unearthly slogan tore every other cry but his to shreds. But at last, in his untraceable evolutions, the white whale so crossed and recrossed and in a thousand ways entangled the slack of the three lines now fast to him, that they foreshortened and of themselves warped the devoted boats toward the planted irons in him. Though now for a moment, the whale drew aside a little, as if to rally for a more tremendous charge. Seizing that opportunity, Ahab first paid out more line and then was rapidly hauling and jerking in upon it, in upon it again, hoping that way to disencumber it of some snarls, when lo, a sight more savage than the embattled teeth of sharks. Caught and twisted, corkscrewed in the mazes of the line, loose harpoons and lances with all their bristling barbs and points came flashing and dripping up to the chocks and the bows of Ahab's boats. Only one thing could be done. Seizing his boat knife, he critically reached within, through, and then without, the rays of steel dragged in the line behind, passed it inboard to the bowsman, and then, twice sundering the rope near the chocks, chopped the intercepted, intercepted fag of steel into the sea, and was all fast again. That instant, the white whale made a stubborn rush among the remaining tangles of the other lines, by so doing, irresistibly dragged the more involved boats of stub and flask toward his flukes, dashed them together like two rolling husks on a surf-beaten beach, and then, diving down into the sea, disappeared in a boiling maelstrom, in which, for a space, the odorous cedar chips of the wrecks danced round and round like the grated nutmeg in a swiftly stirred bowl of punch. While the two crews were yet circling in the waters, reaching out after the revolving line tubs, oars, and other floating furniture, while a slope little flask bobbed up and down like an empty vial, twitching his legs upward to escape the dreaded jaws of sharks, and Stubb was lustily singing out for someone to ladle him up, and while the old man's line, now parting, admitted of his pulling into the creamy pool to rescue whom he could, in that wild simultaneousness of a thousand concreted perils, Ahab's yet unstricken boat seemed drawn up toward heaven by invisible wires. As arrow-like shooting perpendicularly from the sea, the white whale dashed his broad forehead against its bottom and sent it turning over and over into the air, till it fell again, gunwale downward, and Ahab and his men struggled out from under it like seals from a seaside cave. The first uprising momentum of the whale modifying its direction as he struck the surface, involuntarily launched him along it to a little distance from the center of the destruction he had made. And with his back to it, he now lay for a moment, slowly feeling with his flukes from side to side. And whenever a stray oar, a bit of plank, the least chip or crumb of the boats touched his skin, his tail swiftly drew back and came sideways, smiting the sea. But soon, as if satisfied that his work for the time was done, he pushed his pleated forehead through the ocean and trailing after him the intertangled lines, continued his leeward way at a traveler's methodic pace. As before, the attentive ship having described the whole fight again came bearing down to the rescue 
and dropping a boat, picked up the floating mariners, tubs, oars, and whatever else could be caught at, and safely landed them on her decks. Some sprained shoulders, wrists and ankles, livid contusions, wrenched harpoons and lances, inextricable intricacies of rope, shattered oars and planks, all these were there, but no fatal or even serious ill seemed to have befallen anyone. As with Fadala the day before, so Ahab was now found grimly clinging to his boat's broken half, which afforded a comparatively easy float, nor did it so exhaust him as the previous day's mishap. But when he was held to the deck, all eyes were fastened upon him, as instead of standing by himself, he still half hung upon the shoulder of Starbuck, who had thus far been the foremost to assist him. His ivory leg had been snapped off, leaving but one short, sharp splinter. I eye Starbuck, tis sweet to lean sometimes, be the leaner who he will, and would old Ahab had leaned oftener than he has. The ferule has not stood, sir, said the carpenter, now coming up. I put good work into that leg. But no broken bones, sir, I hope, said Stubb, with true concern. Aye, and all splintered to pieces, Stubb, do you see it? But even with a broken bone, old Ahab is untouched, and I count no living bone of mine one jot more me than this dead one that's lost. Nor white whale, nor man, nor fiend can so much as graze all Ahab in his own proper and inaccessible being. Can any lead touch yonder floor, any mast scrape yonder roof, aloft there, which way? Dead to leeward, sir. Up helm, then. Pile on the sail again, ship keepers. Down the rest of the spare boats and rig them. Mr. Starbuck, away, and muster the boat's crews. Let me first help thee toward the bulwarks, sir. Ah, oh, ah, oh, how this splinter gores me now, a cursed fate that the unconquerable captain in the soul should have such a craven mate. Sir? My body, man, not thee. Give me something for a cane. There, that shivered lance will do. Muster the men. Surely I have not seen him yet. By heaven, that cannot be missing? Quick, call them all. The old, man hinted, the old man's hinted thought was true. Upon mustering the company, the Parsi was not there. Parsi cried Stubb. He must have been caught in the black vomit wrench thee. Run all of ye above, allow, captain, forecastle, find him, not gone, not gone. But quickly they returned to him with the tidings that the Parsi was nowhere to be found. Ay, sir, said Stubb. Caught among the tangles of your line. I thought I saw him dragging under. My line? My line? Gone? Gone? What means that little word? What death knell rings in it that old Ahab shakes as if he were the belfry? The harpoon, too. Toss over the litter there. Do you see it? The forged iron men, the white whales. No, 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 blistered fool. This hand did dart it. Tis in the fish. Aloft there. Keep him nailed. Quick. All hands to the riggings of the boats. Collect the oars. Harpooners. The irons. The irons. Hoist the royals higher. A pull on all the sheets. Helm there. Steady. Steady for your life. I'll ten times girdle the unmeasured globe. Yeah, and dive straight through it, but I'll slay him yet. Great God, but for one single instant, show thyself, cried Starbuck. Never, never wilt thou capture him, capture him, old man. In Jesus' name, no more of this. That's worse than devil's madness. Two days chased, twice stove to splinters, Thy very leg once more snatched from under thee, thy evil shadow gone, all good angels mobbing thee with warning. What more wouldst thou have? Shall we keep chasing this murderous fish till he swamps the last man? Shall we be dragged by him to the bottom of the sea? Shall we be towed by him to the infernal world? Oh, impiety and blasphemy to hunt him more. Starbuck, of late I felt strangely moved to thee. Ever since that hour we both saw, thou knowest what, in one another's eyes. But in this matter of the whale, be the front of thy face to me as the palm of this hand, a lipless, unfeatured blank. Ahab is forever Ahab, man. This whole act's immutably decreed. T'was rehearsed by thee and me a billion years before this ocean rolled, fool. I am the fate's lieutenant. I act under orders. Look thou, underling, that thou obeyest mine. Stand round me, men. You see an old man cut down to the stump, leaning on a shivered lance, propped up on a lonely foot. Tis Ahab. 
his body's part, but Ahab's soul's a centipede that moves upon a hundred legs. I feel strained, half stranded as ropes that tow dismasted frigates in a gale, and I may look so, but ere I break, you'll hear me crack, and till you hear that, know that Ahab's hauser tows his purpose yet. Believe ye men in the things called omens? Then laugh aloud and cry encore, for ere they drown, drowning things will tri twice rise to the surface, then rise again to sink forevermore. So with Moby Dick, two days he's floated, tomorrow will be the third. Aye, men, he'll rise once more, but only to spout his last. Do you feel brave, men? Brave? As fearless fire, cried Stubb. And as mechanical, muttered Ahab. Then as the men went forward, he muttered on, the things called omens. And yesterday I talked the same to Starbuck there concerning my broken boat. Oh, how valiantly I seek to drive out the other's hearts what's clinched so fast in mine. The Parsi, the Parsi, gone, gone. And he was to go before, but still was to be seen again ere I could perish. How is that? There's a riddle now might baffle all the lawyers backed by the ghosts of the whole line of judges. Like a hawk's beak, it pecks my brain. I'll, I'll solve it, though. When dusk descended, the whale was still in sight to leeward. So once more the sail was shortened, and everything passed nearly as on the previous night. Only the sound of hammers and the hum of the grindstone was heard till nearly daylight as the men toiled by lanterns in the complete and careful rigging of the spare boats and sharpening their fresh weapons for the, for the morrow. Meantime of the broken keel of Ahab's wrecked craft, the carpenter made him another leg, while still as on the night before slouched Ahab stood fixed within his scuttle. His hid heliotrope glance anticipatingly gone backward on its dial, set due eastward for the earliest sun. Chapter 135, The Chase, Third Day. The morning of the third day dawned fair and fresh, and once more the solitary nightman at the fore masthead was relieved by crowds of the daylight lookouts, who dotted every mast and almost every spar. Do you see him, cried Ahab, but the whale was not yet in sight. It is infallible wake, though, but follow that wake, that's all. Helm there, steady, as thou goest and hast been going. What a lovely day again, were it a new-made world and made for a summer house to the angels, and this morning, the first of its throwing open to them, a fairer day could not dawn upon that world. Here's food for thought, had Ahab time to think, but Ahab never thinks. He only feels, feels, feels. That's tingling enough for mortal man, to think audacity. God only has that right and privilege. Thinking is, or ought to be, a coolness and a calmness, and our poor hearts throb, our poor brains beat too much for that. And yet, I've sometimes thought my brain was very calm, frozen calm, this old skull cracks so, like a glass in which the contents turn to ice and shiver it. And still this hair is growing now, this moment growing, and heat must breed it. But no, it's like that sort of common grass that will grow anywhere, between the earthly clefts of Greenland ice or in Vesuvius lava. How the wild wind blows it, they whip it about me as the torn shreds of split sails lash the tossed ship they cling to. A vile wind that has no doubt blown air, this through prison corridors and cells and wards of hospitals and ventilated them, and now comes blowing hither as innocent as fleece, out upon it, it's tainted. Were I the wind, I'd blow no more on such a wicked, miserable world. I'd crawl somewhere to a cave and slink there, and yet tis a noble and heroic thing, the wind. Whoever conquered it, in every fight it has the last and bitterest blow. Run tilting at it, and you but run through it. Ha! A coward wind that strikes stark naked men, but will not stand to receive a single blow. Even Ahab is a braver thing, a nobler thing than that. Would now the wind but had a body, but all the things that most exasperate and outrage mortal man, all these things are bodiless, but only bodiless as objects, not as agents. There is a most special, most cunning, oh, a most malicious difference. And yet, I say again and swear it now, that there is something all glorious and gracious in the wind, these warm trade winds at least, that in the clear heavens blow straight on, in strong and steadfast, 
vigorous mildness, and veer not from their mark. However, the baser currents of the sea may turn and tack, and mightiest Mississippis of the land swift and swerve about, and certain where to go at last, and by eternal poles. These same trades that so directly blow my good ship on, these trades are something like them, something so unchangeable and full as strong, blow my keeled soul along. To it, aloft there, what do you see? Nothing, sir, nothing, and nude at hand. The doubloon goes a-begging. See the sun, aye, aye, it must be so. I've oversailed him, how? Got the start, aye, he's chasing me now, not high, him that's bad. I might have known it too, fool. The lions, the harpoons he's towing. I, I, I have run him by it last night. About, about, come down, all ye. But the regular lookouts, man the braces. Steering as she had done, the wind had been somewhat on the Pequod's quarter, so that now being pointed in the reverse direction, the braced ship sailed hard upon the breeze as she returned the cream in her own white wake. Against the wind, he now steers for the open jaw, murmured Starbuck to himself as he coiled the new hauled main brace upon the rail. God keep us, but already my bones feel damp within me and from the inside wet my flesh. I misdoubt me that I disobey my God in obeying him. Stand by to sway me up, cried Ahab, advancing to the hemp and basket. We should meet him soon. Aye, aye, sir. And straight away Starbuck did Ahab's bidding. And once more Ahab swung on high. A whole hour passed now, gold beaten out to the ages. Time itself now held long breaths with keen suspense. But at last, some three points off the weather bow, Ahab descried the spout again. And instantly, from the three mastheads, three shrieks went up, as if the tongues of fire had voiced it. Forehead to forehead, I meet thee this third time, Moby Dick. On deck there, brace, sharper up. Crowd her into the wind's eye. He's too far off to lower yet, Mr. Starbuck. The sails shake. Stand over that helmsman with a top maul. So, so, he travels fast and I must down. But let me one more good round look aloft here at the sea. There's time for that. An old, old sight, and yet somehow so young. Aye, and not changed a wink since I first saw it, a boy from the sand hills of Nantucket. The same, the same, the same to Noah as to me. There's a soft shower to leeward, such lovely leewardings. They must lead somewhere to something else than common land, more palmy than the palms. Leeward, the white whale goes that way. Look to windward, then, the better if the bitterer quarter. But goodbye, goodbye, old masthead. What's this? Green. Aye, tiny mosses in these warped cracks. No such green weather stains on Ahab's head. There's the difference now between old man's age and matters. But I. Old Mast, we both grow old together. Sound in our hulls, though, are we not, my ship? Aye, minus a leg, that's all. By heaven, this dead wood has the better of my live flesh every way. I can't compare with it. And I've known some ships made of dead trees out lest the lives of men made most of the vital stuff of vital fathers. What's that, he said? He should still go before me, my pilot, and yet to be seen again. But where? Will I have eyes at the bottom of the sea, supposing I descend those endless stairs? And all night I've been sailing from him, wherever he did sink to. Aye, aye. Like many more, thou toldst direful truth as touching thyself, O Parsi. But Ahab, there thy shot fell short. Goodbye, masthead. Keep a good eye upon the whale while I'm gone. We'll talk tomorrow, nigh tonight, when the white whale lies down there, tied by head and tail. He gave the word, and still gazing around him, was steadily lowered through the cloven blue air to the deck. In due time, the boats were lowered, but as standing in his shallop stern, Ahab just hovered upon the point of the descent. He waved to the mate, who held one of the tackle ropes on deck, and bade him pause. Starbuck, sir, for the third time, my soul's ship starts upon this voyage, Starbuck. Aye, sir, thou wilt have it so. Some ships sail from their ports and ever afterwards are missing, Starbuck. Truth, sir, saddest truth. Some men die at ebb tide, some at low water, some at the full of the flood. And I feel now like a billow. That's all one crested comb, Starbuck. I am old. Shake hands with me, man. Their eyes met, their eyes fastened. Starbuck's tears the glue. Oh, my captain, my captain, noble heart, go not, go not. See, it's a brave man that weeps. How great the agony of the persuasion then. Lower away, cried Ahab, 
tossing the mate's arm from him. Stand by the crew. In an instant, the boat was pulling round the close under the stern. The sharks, the sharks, cried a voice from the low cabin window there. Oh, master, my master, come back. But Ahab heard nothing, for his own voice was high lifted then, and the boat leaped on. Yet the voice spake true, for scarce had he pushed from the ship when numbers of sharks, seemingly rising from out the dark waters beneath the hull, maliciously snapped at the blades of the oars every time they dipped in the water, and in this way accompanied the boat with their bites. It is a thing not uncommonly happening to the whaleboats in those swarming seas, the sharks at times apparently following them in the same prescient way that vultures hover over the banners of marching regiments in the east. But these were the first sharks that had been observed by the Pequod since the white whale had been first decried, and whether it was that Ahab's crew were all such tiger-yellow barbarians and therefore their flesh more musky to the sense of the sharks, a matter sometimes well known to affect them. However it was, they seemed to follow that one boat without molesting the others. Heart of wrought steel, murmured Starbuck, gazing over the side and following with his eyes the receding boat. Canst thou yet ring boldly to that sight, lowering thy keel among ravening sharks, and followed by them open-mouthed to the chase, and this the critical third day? For when three days flow together in one continuous intense pursuit, be sure the first is the morning, the second the noon, and the third the evening, and the end of that thing, be that end what it may. Oh, my God, what is this that shoots through me and leaves me so deadly calm yet expectant, fixed at the top of a shutter. Future things swim before me as in empty outlines and skeletons. All the past is somehow grown dim. Mary, girl, thou fadest in pale glories behind me. Boy, I seem to see but thine eyes grown wondrous blue. Strangest problems of life seem clearing, but clouds sweep between. Is my journey's end coming? My legs feel faint, like his who has footed it all day. Feel thy heart beats it yet. Stir thyself, Starbuck, stave it off, move, move, speak aloud. Masthead there, see my see ye my boy's hand on the hill? Crazed, aloft there. Keep thy keenest eye upon the boats. Mark well the whale. Ho, oh, again, drive off that hawk, see? He pecks, he tears the vein. Pointing to the red flag at the main truck. Ha, he soars away with it. Where's the old man now? Seest thou that sight? Oh, Ahab, shudder, shudder. The boats had not gone very far when, by a signal from the mastheads, a downward pointed arm, Ahab knew that the whale had sounded, but intending to be near him at the next rising, he held on his way a little sideways from the vessel, the becharmed crew maintaining the profoundest silence as the headbeat waves hammered and hammered against the opposing bow. Drive, drive in your nails, O ye waves, to their uttermost heads drive them in. Ye but strike a thing without a lid, and no coffin and no hearse can be mine, and hemp only can kill me. Ha ha! Suddenly the waters around them slowly swelled in broad circles, then quickly upheaved as if sideways sliding from a submerged berg of ice. Swiftly rising to the surface, a low rumbling sound was heard, a subterraneous hum, and then all held their breaths as bedraggled with trailing ropes and harpoons and lances, a vast form shot lengthwise but obliquely from the sea. Shrouded in a thin drooping veil of mist, it hovered for a moment in the rainbowed air and then fell swamping back into the deep. 
Crushed 30 feet upwards, the waters flashed for an instant like heaps of fountains, then brokenly sank in a shower of flakes, leaving the circling surface creamed like new milk round the marble trunk of the whale. Give way, cried Ahab to the oarsmen, and the boats darted forward to the attack, but maddened by yesterday's fresh irons that corroded in him, Moby Dick seemed combinedly possessed by all the angels that fell from heaven. The wide tears of welded tendons overspreading his broad white forehead beneath the transparent skin looked knitted together as head on he came churning his tail among the boats and once more flailed them apart, spilling out the irons and lances from the two mates' boats and dashing in one side of the upper part of their bows, but leaving Ahab's almost without a scar. While Dagoo and Queequeg were stopping the strained planks, and as the whale swimming out from them turned and showed one entire flank as he shot by them again, at that moment a quick cry went up, lashed round and round to the fish's back, pinioned in the turns upon turns in which during the past night, the whale had reeled the involutions of the lines around him. The half-torn body of the Parsi was seen, his sable raiment frayed to shreds, his distended eyes turned full upon Ahab. The harpoon dropped from his hand. Befooled, befooled! Drawing in a long, lean breath, I, Parsi, I see thee again, I, and thou goest before, and this, this then is the hearse that thou didst promise. But I hold thee to the last letter of thy word. Where is the second hearse? Away, mates, to the ship. Those boats are useless now. Repair them if you can in time and return to me. If not, Ahab is enough to die. Down, men, the first thing that but offers to jump from this boat, I stand in that thing I harpoon. Ye are not other men but my arms and my legs, and so obey me. Where's the whale? Gone down again? But he looked too nigh the boat, for, as if bent upon escaping with the corpse he bore, and as if the particular place of the last encounter had been but a stage in his lured journey, Moby Dick was now again steadily swimming forward and had almost passed the ship, which thus far had been sailing in the contrary direction to him, though for the present her headway had been stopped. He seemed swimming with his utmost velocity and now only intent upon pursuing his own straight path in the sea. Oh, Ahab, cried Starbuck, not too late it is even now, the third day to desist. See, Moby Dick seeks thee not. It is thou, thou that madly seekest him. Setting sail to the rising wind, the lonely boat was swiftly impelled to leeward by both oars and canvas. And at last, when Ahab was sliding by the vessel, so near as plainly to distinguish Starbuck's face as he leaned over the rail, he hailed him to turn the vessel about and follow him, not too swiftly, at a judicious interval. Glancing upward, he saw Tashtigo, Queequeg, and Dagoo eagerly mounting to the three mastheads while the oarsmen were rocking in the two staved boats, which had but just been hoisted to the side and were busily at work in repairing them, one after the other through the portholes as he sped. He also caught flying glimpses of stub and flash, flask, busying themselves on deck among the bundles of new irons and lances. As he saw all this, as he heard the hammers in the broken boats, far other hammers seemed driving a nail into his heart. But he rallied 
and now marking that the vane or flag was gone from the mainmast, he shouted to Tashtigo, who had just gathered that perch, had just gained that perch, to descend again for another flag and a hammer and nails, and so nail it to the mast. Whether fagged by three days running chase and the resistance to his swimming in the knotted hamper he bore, or whether it was some latent deceitfulness and malice in him, whichever was true, the white whale's way now began to abate, as it seemed from the boat so rapidly nearing him once more, though indeed the whale's last start had not been so long a one as before. And still, as Ahab glided over the waves, the unpitying sharks accompanied him and so pertinaciously stuck to the boat and so continually bit at the plying oars that the blades became jagged and crunched and left small splinters in the sea at almost every dip. Heed them not, those teeth, but give new rowlocks to your oars. Pull on! "'Tis the better rest, the shark's jaw, than the yielding water. "'But at every bite, sir, the thin blades grow smaller and smaller. "'They will last long enough. Pull on. "'But who can tell,' he muttered, "'whether these sharks swim to feast on the whale or on Ahab. "'But pull on. Aye, all alive now, we near him. "'The helm, take the helm, let me pass.' And so saying, two of the oarsmen helped him forward to the bows of the still-flying boat. At length, as the craft was cast to one side and ran ranging along with the white whale's flank, he seemed strangely oblivious of its advance, as the whale sometimes will, and Ahab was fairly within the smoky mountain mist, which thrown off from the whale's spout, curled round his great monadnock hump. He was even thus close to him when, with body arched back and both eyes lengthwise high lifted to the poise, he darted his fierce iron and his far fiercer curse into the hated whale. As both steel and curse sank to the socket as if sucked, sucked into a morass, Moby Dick sideways writhed, spasmodically rolled his nigh flank against the bow, and without staving a hole in it so suddenly canted the boat over that had it not been for the elevated part of the gunwale to which he then clung, Ahab would once more have been tossed into the sea. As it was, three of the oarsmen, who foreknew not the precise instant of the dart, and were therefore unprepared for its effects. These were flung out, but so fell that in an instant two of them clutched the gunwale again, and rising to its level on a combing wave, hurled themselves bodily inboard again, the third man helplessly dropping astern, but still afloat and swimming. Almost simultaneously, with a mighty volition of ungraduated instantaneous swiftness, the white whale darted through the weltering sea. But when Ahab cried out to the steersman to take new turns with the line and hold it so, and commanded the crew to turn round on their seats and tow the boat up to the mark, the moment the treacherous line felt that double strain and tug, it snapped in the empty air. What breaks in me? Some sinew cracks. Tis whole again. Oars, oars, burst in upon him. Hearing the tremendous rush of the sea-crashing boat, the whale wheeled round to present his blank forehead at bay. But in that evolution, catching sight of the nearing black hull of the ship, seemingly seeing in it the source of all his persecutions, bethinking it, it may be, a larger and nobler foe, of a sudden, he bore down upon its advancing brow, smiting his jaws amid fiery showers of foam. Ahab staggered. His hand smote his forehead. I grow blind. Hands stretch out before me that I might yet grope my way. Is it night? The whale! The ship! cried the cringing oarsman. Oars! Oars! Slope downwards to thy depths. Oh, see that ere it be for 
ever too late, Ahab may slide this last, last time upon his mark. I see the ship, the ship. Dash on, my men. Will ye not save my ship? But as the oarsmen violently forced their boat through the sledge-hammering seas, the before whale-smitten bowings of two planks burst through, and in an instant almost, the temporarily disabled boat lay nearly level with the waves, its half-wading, splashing crew trying hard to stop the gap and bail out the pouring water. Meantime, for that one beholding instant, Tashtego's masthead hammer remained suspended in his hand, and the red flag, half wrapping him as with a plaid, then streamed itself straight out from him as his own forward flowing heart, while Starbuck and Stud, standing upon the bowsprit beneath, caught sight of the downcoming monster just as soon as he. The whale! The whale! Up helm! Up helm! Oh, all ye sweet powers of air, now hug me close! Let not Starbuck die, if die he must, in a woman's fainting fit. Up helm, I say, ye fools. The jaw, the jaw. Is this the end of all my bursting prayers, all my lifelong fidelities? Oh, Ahab, Ahab, lo, thy work. Steady, helmsman, steady. Nay, nay, up helm again. He turns to meet us. Oh, his unappeasable brow drives on towards one whose duty tells him he cannot depart. My God, stand by me now. Stand not by me, but stand under me, whoever you are, that will now help Stub, for Stub too sticks here. I grin at thee, thou grinning whale. Whoever helped Stub, or kept Stub awake, but Stub's own unwinking eye. And now poor Stub goes to bed upon a mattress that is all too soft, would it were stuffed with brushwood. I grin at thee, thou grinning whale. Look ye, sun, moon, and stars. I call ye assassins of as good a fellow as ever spouted up his ghost. For all that, I would yet ring glasses with thee, would ye but hand the cup. Oh, 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 thou grinning whale, that there'll be plenty of gulping soon. Why fly ye not, O Ahab? For me, off shoes and jacket to it. Let Stub die in his drawers. A most mouldy and over-salted death, though. Cherries, cherries, cherries. Oh, flask for one red cherry ere we die. Cherries? I only wish that we were where they grow. Oh, Stub, I hope my poor mother's drawn my part pay ere this. If not... Few coppers will now come to her, for the voyage is up. From the ship's bows, nearly all the seamen now hung inactive. Hammers, bits of plank, lances and harpoons, mechanically retained in their hands, just as they had darted from their various employments, all their enchanted eyes intent upon the whale, which from side to side, strangely vibrating his predestinating head, sent a broad band of overspreading semicircular foam before him as he rushed. Retribution, swift vengeance, eternal malice were in his whole aspect, and spite of all that mortal man could do, the solid white buttress of his forehead smote the ship's starboard bow till men and timbers reeled. Some fell flat upon their faces. Like dislodged trucks, the heads of the harpooners aloft shook on their bull-like necks. Through the breach they heard the waters pour as mountain torrents down a flume. The ship! The hearse! The second hearse! cried Ahab from the boat. Its wood could only be American. Diving beneath the settling ship, the whale ran quivering along its keel, but turning under water, swiftly shot to the surface again, far off the other bow, but within a few yards of Ahab's boat where, for a time, he lay quiescent. I turn my body from the sun. What ho, Tashtego, let me hear thy hammer. O oh, ye three unsurrendered spires of mine, thou uncracked keel and only God-bullied hull, thou firm deck and haughty helm and pole-pointed prow, death-glorious ship, must ye then perish? And without me, 
Am I cut off from the last fond pride of meanest shipwrecked captains? Oh, lonely death on lonely life. Oh, now I feel my topmost greatness lies in my topmost grief. Ho, ho, from all your furthest bounds, pour ye now in ye bold billows of my whole foregone life, and top this one piled comber of my death. Towards thee I roll, thou all-destroying but unconquering whale. To the last I grapple with thee, from hell's heart I stab at thee. For hate's sake, I spit my last breath at thee. Sink all coffins and all hearses to one common pool. And since neither can be mine, let me then tow to pieces, while still chasing thee, though tied to thee, thou damned whale. Thus I give up the spear. The harpoon was darted. The stricken whale flew forward with igniting velocity. The line ran through the groove, ran foul. Ahab stooped to clear it. He did clear it, but the flying turn caught him around the neck and voicelessly as Turkish mutes bowstring their victim, he was shot out of the boat ere the crew knew he was gone. Next instant, the heavy eye splice in the rope's final end flew out of the stark empty tub, knocked down an oarsman, and smiting the sea, disappeared in its depths. For an instant, the tranced boat's crew stood still, then turned. The ship. Go, great God, where is the ship? Soon they, through dim, bewildering mediums, saw her sidelong fading phantom, as in the gaseous Fata Morgana, only the uppermost masts out of water, where fixed by infatuation or fidelity or fate to their once lofty perches, the pagan harpooners still maintained their sinking lookouts on the sea. And now concentric circles seized the lone boat itself and all its crew and each floating oar and every lance pole and spinning, animate and inanimate, all round and round in one vortex carried the smallest chip of the Pequod out of sight. But as the last whelmings intermixingly poured themselves over the sunken head of the Indian at the mainmast, leaving a few inches of the erect spar yet visible, together with long streaming yards of the flag, which calmly undulated with ironical coincidings over the destroying billows they almost touched, at that instant a red arm and a hammer hovered backwardly uplifted in the open air in the act of nailing the flag faster and yet faster to the subsiding spar. A skyhawk that tauntingly had followed the main truck downwards from its natural home among the stars, pecking at the flag and incommoding Tashtego there, this bird now chanced to intercept its broad fluttering wing between the hammer and the wood, and simultaneously feeling that ethereal thrill the submerged savage beneath in his death gasp kept his hammer frozen there, and so the bird of heaven, with archangelic shrieks and his imperial beak thrust upwards and his whole captive form folded in the flag of Ahab, went down with his ship, which, like Satan, would not sink to hell till she had dragged a living part of heaven along with her and helmeted herself with it. Now small fowls flew screaming over the yet yawning gulf. A sullen white surf beat against its steep sides, then all collapsed, and the great shroud of the sea rolled on as it rolled 5,000 years ago. Epilogue. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee, Job. The drama's done. Why then here does anyone step forth? Because one did survive the wreck. It's so chance that after the Parsi's disappearance, I was he whom the fates ordained to take the place of Ahab's bowsman, when that bowsman assumed the vacant post. The same who, when on the last day, the three men were tossed from out of the rocking boat, was dropped astern. So floating on the margin of the ensuing scene and in full sight of it, when the half spent suction of the sunk ship reached me, I was then but slowly drawn to the closing vortex. When I reached it, 
it had subsided to a creamy pool. Round and round then, and ever contracting towards the button-like black bubble at the axis of that slowly wheeling circle, like another Ixion, I did revolve. Till gaining that vital center, the black bubble upward burst, and now liberated by the reason of its cunning spring, and owing to its great buoyancy, rising with great force, the coffin life buoy shot lengthwise from the sea, fell over and floated by my side. Buoyed up by that coffin for almost one whole day and night, I floated on a soft and dirge-like mane. The unharming sharks, they glided by as if with padlocks on their mouths. The savage seahawks sailed with sheathed beaks. On the second day, a sail drew near, nearer, and picked me up at last. It was the devious cruising Rachel that in her retracing search after her missing children only found another orphan. Finnis. Thank you for being a part of this year's Moby Dick Marathon. Whether you popped in and out or read along with us from cover to cover, you were part of something special. We here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum truly cherish the marathon. For 25 years, we've read this together. We've thought about its meanings and tried to uncover its hidden metaphors. We love welcoming old friends and new and hearing fresh perspectives about what the book means to each of you. There really is no better word to describe the marathon except magical. At the beginning of the marathon, I mentioned togetherness and how very important it is to all of us as a museum, as a team, and as a community. It's been wonderful to be together over the past 24 hours in one form or another. We'll meet you again next year, same time, same place. And remember, it's not down on any map, true places never are. Thank you for your continued support and friendship. We wish you health and happiness this coming year. We'll be here online and in person and hope to see you very soon.